Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, this week's um, episode or workshop on an introduction to machine learning with Scikit-Learn and um, Keras and TensorFlow. Uh, today, we're going to focus mostly on uh, machine learning with Scikit-Learn. Um, and my name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the Calist Visualization Core Laboratory, and I'm also a certified instructor with Sol uh, with software carpentry and data carpentry. Um, software carpentry and data carpentry are two global nonprofit organizations whose focus is teaching foundational um, scientific computing, uh, data science, machine learning skills such as Python, SQL, Git, um, the Bash shell, the things that we've been covering this term. Their goal is to teach those, uh, those foundational skills to academics and research professionals uh, in industry um, and elsewhere. So, um, well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started today. So I've already sent out the links um, for the GitHub repo and for the, comp the compute resources. If you are watching this video on YouTube, you can check the, the description below the video and you'll find the, the links to the GitHub repo and the compute resources that we're gonna use, as well as um, any other uh, interesting resources or URLs that we uncovered during the course of this workshop. So I'm just going to share my screen and we're going to get to work. Okay, so I've launched my compute resources by clicking one of these buttons, either the Calst Binder Hub if you're joining from Calst or the Public uh, Binder Hub or JupyterLab if you're joining from outside of Calst. And um, and you will get a JupyterLab instance running in the cloud. And this is where we're going to do our work. So in particular, in um, today, we're going to be using uh, notebooks. So if you go inside um, the uh, notebooks directory, then in the notebooks directory, we have um, two notebooks. And so when I've taught this course in the past, I've tended to break it up into uh, two afternoon sessions. Um, Today, we're going to have to go at a kind of a breakneck pace uh, to try to cover, perhaps at a higher level, um, both parts one and part two. So we'll see how we get on. But uh, both parts one and part two uh, are here. And so you will have, uh, even if you don't cover something, you'll be able to go through and run the code on your own. So let's start with part one. So if we click on part one, this will open our um, part one IPython notebook. And now I'm just going to hide the uh, file browser window. OK. So in this part one, we're going to cover um, four things from uh, chapter two of Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn, Keras, and TensorFlow. We're going to talk about how to work with real data, um, and then some higher level concepts like uh, what is the big picture? You know, what are you trying to do when you're solving a machine learning um, a machine learning project or when you're starting out on a new machine learning project. We're going to talk about getting the data and then we're going to access the data that we're going to use um, in this workshop. And then we're going to do some basic exploratory data analysis. So kind of all the prep work and we're going to do all the prep work that you would need to do before you start thinking about how am I going to apply um, machine learning algorithms. And then actually this shouldn't say next Thursday, this should say um, um, later this afternoon, we will talk about um, actual applying machine learning algorithms to the data, talk about how to select a model, train a model, fine tune the model, and um, we'll see some code and walk through the process of, of running that code. So that's the goal for today, to kind of take you very quickly through a a machine learning project from getting started. How do I ask the right questions? How do I do some data analysis to uh, fitting a model and um, kind of comparing model performance and then fine tuning model performance and things like this. Okay, so, uh, so part one, so working with real data. So when you are just getting started um, with machine learning and you want to do um, you want to find some machine learning projects to, to learn on. Um, 
Um, the best way to do that is through getting hold of real world data as opposed to kind of simulated data um, or other forms of artificial data. So I've provided um, a, several links here to uh, different resources where you can get access to real world data. So there is the, um, the University of California Irvine's um, machine learning repository. So there's a whole bunch of data sets here. You can just kind of go through and follow the links and they will explain the process of, of downloading those data sets. Um, there's also Kaggle. Oops. Um, Kaggle is probably um, a place that I would really recommend that you get started. There's a great community um, in Kaggle um, in terms of you know, helping you learn how to do machine learning on real world data. There's competitions where you can earn prizes um, or sometimes even cash competitions, um, depending from both academic research topics as well as industry sponsored um, uh, competitions. So it's a really good learning resource. Um, and then there, there's some other, um, other resources here as well. I don't want to go through, um, go through all of them. Um, also, the, the three major cloud providers, so um, AWS, GCP, Microsoft Azure, um, they also have their own repositories of publicly available data sets. So if you were to say, um, click on the AWS link, you'll be taken to, um, I hope, internet connection must be a bit slow today. I'll come back to that in a minute. So eventually you'll be taken to the open data repository. Oh, there we go on AWS. And you can search through the data sets that they have. Um, some of them are industry sponsored. So there's a Facebook data set. Some of them are um, government sponsored. So I see a lot of US government um, uh, data sets here from NASA, um, National Institute of Health, uh, National Oceanographic Atmospheric agency, something like this, uh, uh, space telescope, all kinds of stuff. Um, some of these data sets might be very, very, very large computing level of resources. Some of them might be very small that you could actually download them um, onto your laptop, your workstation and work with them there if you wished. Um, and then finally, I want to point out a really interesting package called Pandas Data Reader. I keep wanting to right click open in a new tab. I forget that I don't need to do that in Jupyter. So Pandas Data Reader is a, um, uh, a Python project that you can install and it integrates um, with a number of repositories uh, for getting access to data and downloading it directly. So there is um, a data service on banking and financial data in the United States called FRED from the Federal uh, Reserve Board in the US. And that's one of the data sets that you can, you can access there. Um, if you go through the documentation, you'll find out that there's a huge number of different repositories for, um, for data that you can get access, like World Bank data, IMF data, um, that's International Monetary Fund. Um, there are a whole bunch of, of data repositories. There's a, a resource called Quandl. Um, I think I have a link to, yeah, okay. So if we click on this number of data sets, I've actually provided the link to the documentation. So this gives you a, a more um, complete list of the data sets that you can get access to. So like Quandl, for example, uh, if we open that in a new tab. So um, Quandl is a, uh, actually, here's the link to Quandl. Um, Quandl is a, an online data repository. Some of the data is free, some of it costs. Um, um, sometimes there's API limits on the amount of data that you can uh, that you can download. Um, but there is a lot of um, particularly financial data um, available uh, via Quandl. Okay. So lots of data sets. And when you want to get started and you want to practice, you should use real world data sets. Don't use some simulated or artificial data sets that you found, you found someplace. Okay. That's the key takeaway from there. Okay.
questions um, about um, data sets before we move on to the next, to talking about the data that we are actually going to use today. Anything? Nope. Okay. Well, maybe one. Let's check. So the question is, are all of these data are structured? Yes. So they are, um, they're typically all structured, particularly anything that you can get from the pandas data reader is going to um, extract this data into a pandas data frame by, um, by construction. So that's part of the, what the software does for you is it goes and grabs the data from the web, downloads it into a pandas data frame. And then once it's in a pandas data frame, you can write it out to whatever your preferred storage format is. So all of these data sets will be um, quite structured um, in that sense and, and, it, and, and reasonably clean. And we'll talk about um, data cleanliness um, in a minute. Okay, so let's go back to, to JupyterLab. And Pandas Data Reader is already installed. So um, I referenced the environment file for this software stack earlier. Um, but if we look at it again, so this is the complete list of all the tools that have been installed in this software stack. And so um, you could use what you learned in the introduction to Conda for data science uh, training that we did earlier this semester to replicate this entire software stack on your local laptop or workstation or on the public cloud somewhere, um, anywhere where you can get access to computing resources. And you'll see here that I have installed Pandas Data Reader um, into the into the environment. So I try to make it easy for you guys to get started and pick up where this leaves off and do, um, do other things with it. Okay, so what we're gonna work with today is a data set from the US, the 1990 US Census data set from California. So this data set is, is interesting in that it, it um, takes uh, housing price data and joins it up with data on socioeconomic um, groups uh, of California residents. So it's a bit old, um, you know, hard to believe that, you know, 1990 was, you know, 30, over 30 years ago. Um, so it's a bit old, but it's, um, it's a good data set for teaching regression, at, at, which is what we're going to work on today. And, um, and the compute requirements are, are not, uh, not quite, not very large, so we can do this with you know just a few cores and a few gigs of RAM that we have here for free on the cloud. Okay, um, so the the data is going to be published in terms of census block groups, which is the smallest geographical unit that the U.S. Census Bureau publishes data for. Um, so obviously they, they gather data on individual people in the United States, but for data privacy reasons, they don't release the data on individual people. Um, what they release is an aggregated version of the data. And what they do is they aggregate up to what are called census block groups and then release, um, release uh, reduced data for the aggregate group. So you might get total population per census block or median income per census block or median house price per census block, uh, things like this. Okay, and then here's a nice picture. We're gonna see how to reproduce this figure uh, nearly um, in, uh, in a little bit in code, uh, but this is taken from chapter two of uh, hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn. Okay, so the next thing I, I wanna talk about is, so that's, that's basically the data. That's the data that we're gonna be working with today. Um, and so what I wanna do now is kind of, um, motivate some questions that you should ask whenever you're starting a new um, machine learning project. So things that you need to think about uh, before you even get started to help make sure that you get started in a productive uh, direction. So, um, and you, you know, believe it or not, like most of the work that you will do when you're doing data science or machine learning is not actually fitting models. Fitting and, fitting and training of models is, you know, maybe 10 to 15% of your individual time. It might be a lot of the computer's time will be spent doing that, but a lot of your time 
will not be spent doing that. Most of your time will be making sure that you've got the problem set up and formulated in the right way so that when you start training models and fitting models and making predictions that you're doing something that generates value, whether that's value for your PI if you're doing research or for yourself if you are you know, working on your PhD or value for your company if you are you know, working in industry. So you can throw all the compute at a problem that you want, but if you've not formulated the problem correctly in a way that the answer that the computer is going to generate will create value, then um, you've not really done anything. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about now. In particular, framing the problem. So how do we frame the problem? So you know, sometimes if you're doing academic research, it will be true that the model is the overall objective in the sense that you know, you're developing a new technique or a new modeling paradigm or modeling pipeline, and you're writing a paper about that model. So then in that case, the model is the objective. But that's, I think, a minority of use cases. In most cases, the model is not the overall objective. The model is just kind of one piece of a larger, pro a larger process whose overall goal is to generate some value for the business or answer some particular research question. And so, when you go to make a model, you need to understand how that model is going to fit inside this larger context. Um, so today, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a model for predicting house prices. So, um, and this model is part of a, a hypothetical business whose objective is to make money by investing in houses. So the business goal is to make money by investing in houses. Our house price prediction model is going to be only one of a collection of models that have to work together in terms of a overall data pipeline to achieve the business objective. And so this schematic here, which is taken from chapter two, tries to explain that. So, you know, our data is going to be one of potentially many data sets that live in this, uh, this database or this data storage, uh, data lake or data warehouse, however we want to think of it. And um, other sources of data could be the outputs of models that are called upstream components. So these could be models of other aspects of the, um, of the investment process that could be useful for inputs to our house pricing prediction model. So we're just going to be focusing on this right here. And the outputs of our model, which are going to be the prices, that's what we're going to predict, is going to be combined with other data and that together is going to determine the uh, uh, investment analysis, which is then going to be used to actually make decisions about buying and selling houses in order to try to make money. So that's kind of what I, I want you to think about is how um, when you're getting started and you want to build a model of something, think about this larger context and think about how your model fits as maybe one component within a larger system. The next thing that you need to ask is what is the current solution? Um, so before you set out to build you know, the world's greatest deep learning model to predict uh, housing prices, you might want to ask, you know, what is the current solution for predicting housing prices that is currently being used to generate investment analysis and thus make investments? Because the current solution might not be very sophisticated. The current solution might be, well, we, we look at the data on housing prices in these census blocks, and we just assume that, um, that the house price is going to be um, the, I don't know, some multiple of the uh, median income in that housing unit or in that census block group or something like this. So they could just be taking like a simple heuristic or a simple back of the envelope calculation to predict housing prices. Um, and, uh, and then using the same price prediction for maybe even all, all the houses within a particular census block group. So the, 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 current, the current solution might not be that sophisticated. And if it's not that sophisticated, then you probably don't want to immediately run off and start building the world's greatest deep learning model. Because the, the effort to do that is very high, the payoff is uncertain. It'd be much better to start with building a, if, building a, a simpler um, modeling, a simple model, like what we're going to build today with Scikit-Learn, 
um, and see how well that improves over the status quo. And then once you have a new benchmark, then you can start thinking about how can I iter iteratively refine my model towards you know, improving it over time. Um, and this is also true even of, you know, even in academic situations where, you know, deep learning is, you know, the hot, uh, the hot new technology to use in all of these problems. In Kaggle competitions, for example, um, gradient boosted machines um, win more Kaggle competitions than deep learning models. And this is even true in many computer vision applications. Um, gradient boosted machines, um, we might talk about those a little bit later, but they're implemented in scikit-learn, they're implemented in XGBoost. There's also a light GBM package. Um, all of these are installed in the, uh, the environment that we have here that we're working with. Um, those are um, modeling uh, algorithms that it's much easier to get started with than jumping to something like deep learning. And they will often outperform deep learning, not always, but often. And it's, um, it's important that you try these um, simpler approaches, simpler algorithms, before you just immediately assume that you need to try to do something very sophisticated. OK. So always know what your current solution is before jumping in and trying to build a more sophisticated solution. OK. So, so now we're ready to start designing our, our system, our machine learning system, and we need to frame the problem by answering some more questions. So the first is, are we talking about supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement learning? So supervised learning, and there's a link here to you know, various the definitions of these things. So supervised learning is where your data set gives you um, data on features and data on a target that you're trying to predict. So in this case, we have features, which are going to be socioeconomic variables like population, median income per census block, things like this. And also, we have median house prices for that census block. So that's our target. So that's we're, we're going to try to train a model to use our input features on socioeconomic variables to predict the median house price, which we also have in our data set. So today, we're going to be doing supervised learning. OK, and I'll leave the you know, the other unsupervised reinforcement learning, you can click on those um, if you're uncertain as to what the differences between uh, supervised and these other two forms of learning are. The second question that we need to know is, are we doing a classification problem or a regression problem or something else? So um, we, are, we are doing a regression task. So we're trying to use socioeconomic data to predict a target, and our target is, in this case, it's a floating point number, it's a price. So typically, when you're dealing with trying to predict floating point numbers, you're talking about a regression problem often. Um, classification problems would be like, you know, I have uh, input images which are, you know, handwritten digits or something, and I'm trying to predict like which digit is this from the image. So you might have image data, and then you're trying to predict which class. You know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, does this image fall into? Or you've got a whole bunch of pictures, mix of dogs and cats, and you want to predict, you know, is a particular picture a dog or a cat? So that would be another example of a classification task. Um, a way that you could think about predicting house prices as a classification task is that um, instead of predicting um, house, the house price itself, you could do something like say, okay, well, I want to predict whether house prices are um, high, uh, medium, or low, or maybe overvalued or undervalued. And then you could use your socioeconomic data to predict, um, and the house price data itself, to predict whether houses in that census block seem to be overvalued or undervalued. A model that predicts overvalued and undervalued might be very useful for um, doing investment analysis of the type we're doing here. Um, but that's, um, that's just another way that you could, uh, that you can sometimes think of regression, converting regression problems to classification problems. Um, but today we're going to be doing regression. Okay. Um, and then the last question, so these first two are very, very important. Um, the, the second two, or the, the third one, um, is are you doing batch learning or online learning? So batch learning is where we're going to look at all of the data at once 
and we are going to build a model based on that large batch of data. Online learning is where um, we have data coming in in near real time, and we need to train a model that will be constantly learning based on the new data that's coming in. So that's a different way of, um, of, uh, of thinking about a learning problem. So in this case, we're doing batch learning. So we're just going to look at all the data at once and build our model. OK. So the next thing that we, um, that we need to think about, so we're, once we figured out that we're doing supervised learning, we're doing a regression, solving a regression problem, and we're doing batch learning, we need to select our performance measure. What is our measure of success? What is it going to, what does our model need to do well? So in this case, we're going to take the most standard performance measure for regression problems, which is root, root mean squared error. And here, this, um, um, this function h here stands in for the model that we're going to build. And so h of x is basically given the input data x, what does our model predict for the price? And here, this y is going to be the actual price. And then we look at the difference, we square them, we sum up those differences up across all of the data observations, and then we take the average, and then we take the square root, because if you, rem if you remember, our data is going to be a house price, our prediction is going to be a house price, so the units here are prices. When we square them, our units are prices squared, and it would be better if we have uh, units on our um, performance measure that are more interpretable directly by us. So we take the square root and we get back to basically the same units that we had um, we were working with in our target data. Okay. Um, so there's a, a nice question in, um, in the chat, which leads us into our first exercise actually. So um, the question in the chat is for a regression problem, you know, which is better for measuring performance? Root mean squared error, um, MAE um, or MSE. And so these are all different metrics. So I've put a link here actually in the uh, notebook to the list, to the scikit-learn documentation on all the different metrics. And so we can look through here and, and look at the different metrics that we could use. So these are all classification metrics, um, clustering metrics and uh, regression metrics. So we have, um, um, so MAE, and which was referenced in the question on, on the chat, is mean absolute error. And the mean absolute error is instead of squaring the errors and then taking the square root, um, we are taking the absolute value of the errors and adding all those, uh, all those up. So it's a different way of, of calculating the error. In fact, you could see that if you were to click on um, mean absolute error. And then I think they will have the formula in here somewhere, or maybe not. Um, maybe it's in the user guide. Here it is. Yeah, it's in the user guide. So you can see here's the, the mean absolute error, where you're taking the absolute value of the differences between your model's prediction and the target value that we actually have. And then you sum those up and then you take the average. And then the mean squared error is um, what we will be doing, except we don't take the square root. Here with the mean squared error, you basically just square the errors, sum them up, and then take the average. Um, and you don't take the square root. So what I would like you to do is, so we're going to import from scikit-learn the um, why have I lost my kernel? So I seem to have lost my kernel um, um, up here. So if this happens to you, then you can just click on this no kernel and then select Python 3 and then select, and you'll get your kernel back. Um, yeah, so now we have the kernel back. So what we want to do is, um, import the scikit-learn metrics package. So we can hit shift and enter and import this package. And then once we've imported it, we can take a look at some of the metrics. 
So if we type metrics and hit dot and then tab, so these are all of the metrics that you could possibly use. And I provided, again, there's a link to the documentation as well. But if we started typing, so um, let's see, let's do, let's find root mean squared error. Uh, mean, oh, let's just do mean squared error. So we can find mean squared error. And then we can get the doc string and um, read more about um, the different metric or the how you would use this metric. So what I want you to do is take just about um, three minutes and I just want you to kind of look through the documentation for scikit-learn and look at different metrics. You can look at the doc strings. Um, again, here the link to the documentation is here. And um, and then just have an explore, look at the different metrics, think about um, why uh, you might want to use different metrics. And then I will make some comments about um, why we might want to use the root mean squared error in this case instead of the, uh, the mean absolute error um, or what uh, the difference between those two might be. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing screen. And I'll set a timer on my watch. And so three minutes. So So is anyone having issues with um, with the Jupyter Lab disconnecting? Because it's happened to me um, at least once. And I'm trying to see if it happens to anyone else. Okay, and while you guys are having a think and looking at the documentation, I'll just share my screen uh, quickly. So there've been some questions about where are we, or like how to get access to the um, um, to the notebook. So once you've started up the the JupyterLab um, instance, if you look in the notebooks directory, the the notebooks that we're working with are stored there. So you can just double click on them and open them up, and that's where you'll find them. So you open your file, you should be here in the root directory, just double click on the notebooks and then double click on the particular notebook. Okay, so that's been about uh, about three minutes. So just a, a quick so let's have a quick discussion about these um, these different metrics, and let's look at um, so the mean. So let's look here in the um, um, in the scikit-learn docs, and we'll compare mean absolute error and mean squared error, and then talk about why we might want to compare one or use one with the other. So first off, there's no hard or fast rule to determine which metric is better. It always depends on 
um, the context of your problem and what kinds of errors you're most concerned about in your model. So if you look at the mean squared error, so um, when we compute the overall value of our mean squared error, we're summing up squared differences between our model's predictions and the true values in the data. So that means that um, the outliers in our model predictions, so places where our model is making big mistakes, where this gap is large between the predicted values and the actual values, those values are going to be weighted much more heavily in the overall mean squared error compared with the mean absolute error where we're just taking absolute values. So, you know, if our model predictions were off by, um, say, you know, a million US dollars, then that error in mean squared error would be squared. So it would be a million squared. Whereas if you were computing the mean absolute error and our error was a million dollars, it would just still be just a million dollars when adding up the sum. So when you're working with mean squared error, you're putting, you're saying that basically you want to put more importance on uh, fitting a model that is going to fit the outliers, uh, not fit the outliers, but place more weight on large errors in your predictions relative to something like mean absolute error. Whether that makes sense within the context of your problem is up for you as the, the data scientist or the uh, machine learning engineer to decide. Now, when comparing a mean squared error versus root mean squared error, it's more of a, a convenience thing. Like I typically work with root mean squared error because I like to have the units of my, um, of my, um, my metric be the same as the units of the thing that I'm trying to predict. So here I'm predicting house price, or in our context, we're predicting house prices. So the model errors are going to be in house prices. So we have predicted house price minus the house price. The errors are or the the area is a house price, which then gets squared. And I want to take the square root so that the units of my overall mean squared error are in, you know, in this case, dollars, U.S. dollars, as opposed to squared U.S. dollars, which is a lot harder for me to to think about. Okay, so hopefully that. Um, gives you a flavor of the kinds of, um, of things that you need to think about. And choosing a, a, choosing a metric uh, performance measure is important. It's important that you do that very early because if you choose your metric later, there's gonna be a temptation to find a metric for which your model performs very well and say, this is my metric. And it makes your modeling look good, maybe better than it ought to. Whereas if you're disciplined and you pick your performance measure up front, then you can't really be accused of, of cherry picking or of picking a model that you know, fits that metric or that picking um, a whole process that somehow, or picking a metric that, sorry, let me back up. You want to choose your performance measure upfront before you start your project so that um, you can avoid the temptation to you know, build some model and then keep changing the metrics around until you find a metric for which your model performs well. Okay. Um, all right. So let's let's move uh, move on. There's quite a lot that you more that you could discuss about metrics, but we've got more to talk about today. Okay. Um, finally, you want to check your assumptions. So um, we've set up our machine learning problem as a supervised um, uh, regression problem, batch using batch learning. Um, but it's important to talk to the, the stakeholders or the people who are going to use the predictions of your model. So for example, you know, maybe you think you need to predict a price, but then when you go and talk to, um, let's go back up here to our modeling pipeline. So maybe you think you need to actually predict the price, but then when you talk to the people doing the investment analysis, they actually have a heuristic that takes a predicted price and converts it into, is this house, um, overvalued or undervalued or fairly valued. 
So in which case, maybe it would be better if you actually built a model to predict that classification. And then they could avoid having to use this kind of heuristic on your the output of your regression uh, model. So it's really important to invest that time to find out, you know, um, how are your outputs of your model going to be used and make sure that people who are using your model's predictions, um, that you two teams are on the same page in terms of how these models are going to be used and how they're going to integrate with one another. Okay. So get the data. Um, so we're going to, now we're going to talk about, you know, getting the data and how to create the workspace and things like that. So fortunately we don't have much to do in terms of creating the workspace. So there's quite a lot in chapter two that goes through a lot of the stuff that we covered in um, the introduction to Conda workshop earlier this semester, um, in particular on how to create a virtual environment and install all the dependencies. Um, I believe chapter two focuses more on using PIP to do that. Um, I prefer to use Conda. Um, and, but we don't need to do that. We've already started up our, um, um, our virtual uh, environment and we've got it running in our cloud resources using Conda and PIP. And um, you can check out the, if you, if you didn't join us for the earlier introduction to Conda for data scientists workshop, you can uh, check it out on our YouTube channel. Okay. So now we actually are going to download the data. So typically, um, you're going to want to write some Python code to actually automate the process of downloading your data um, and from wherever it lives and storing it somewhere on your laptop, your workstation, or whatever server you're working on. Um, if it's a large data set, you typically will only want to run this, you only run this kind of code once, download the data once, and then always access it from a local, um, a local connection. Um, but if it's a small data set like this, you might find it's just actually easier to download the data every time. Um, so in this case, we are going to um, hit shift and enter to execute this cell. I've lost my kernel again. Um, so, okay. Um, so I had to get my kernel started up again and we will hit shift and enter to execute this cell. And then this basically is gonna define this Python function. And then in the next cell, we'll hit shift and enter again to execute the cell. And that's actually going to fetch the run this function and fetch the data for us. Now, I, I believe that I, um, that I already stored this data uh, locally um, in the data housing directory. Um, so it should already be there. Um, so we really didn't have to download anything. So it didn't take, uh, that's why it, it executed so quickly. Okay, so now we've downloaded the data. Um, I guess the other thing I should, I should say is that if you are working, um, you know, maybe at a company that has a, a large database where all of your company's data is stored, then this downloading the data would be more like fetching the data from a, um, a, uh, a SQL database or something like this. Um, right, so sorry, there's a couple of questions in chat about, okay. Um, I will share, so there are quite more questions in chat about getting access to the compute resources. So I'm just going to copy this link and I'll just paste it again in chat. So click this link. Okay. So we're going to load the data. So we're going to be using pandas. So I have a link here to the Python for data analysis, second edition. So that is the other book together with introduction to machine learning with scikit-learn, um, or sorry, introduction to hand, hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn. So these two books are the ones that I use when, uh, the first editions of these books are the ones that I use when I was getting started with, with all of these concepts. So, um, 
if we execute this cell by hitting shift and enter, we will have loaded our um, data into this housing uh, data frame variable. And then we can look at it. So we can look at the first five rows and always a good idea to just take a quick look at the first few rows of the data, make sure it seems like it loaded properly. So in this case, we have some geo coordinates, some longitude and latitude coordinates, and then we've got some um, housing median age, uh, the total rooms. And remember, these rows are for a census block group or a district. So this is the total number of rooms across all houses in the district. So you might think well, that's a bit weird. Like usually you, if you think about predicting the price of a house, you might be thinking about the total rooms in the house, not like the total number of rooms in all houses in a particular area. So we might need to do something called feature engineering later where we take our raw data and engineer some better variables for predicting house prices. Um, uh, in particular, we have the total number of households. So maybe if we were doing something like dividing total rooms by the total number of households, then we would get number of rooms per, uh, per household, just as an example. Um, and we've got total population. Um, this is obviously probably not in people, but probably maybe millions of people or something like this. Um, but it's good to, to try to understand what units we're dealing with. Um, median income, so this is going to be probably not in dollars, but maybe uh, tens of thousands of dollars. So 8.32 would be something like $80,000, um, uh, $80, $83,000. Um, median house values, um, and then something about ocean proximity. So the median house value is the thing that we're gonna be trying to predict. And then we have this ocean proximity variable, which is seems to take values describing like whether or not this district is Um, right, so we've looked at the first few rows. The next thing we want to do is look at some more information about the data frame. So if we look at the use the dot info method, we can get some more information. So the first thing that we can see is that um, we have uh, 20,640 rows, and it looks like all of the rows with the exception of this, uh, all, all the columns rather, with the exception of this total bedrooms column has, um, is not missing any data. So we can see here that the total bedrooms has only 20,433 non-null entries. So that means that there are 210-ish um, missing values in the total bedrooms. So we'll have to think about how are we going to handle that later? How are we going to deal with missing values? Um, looks like all of the data are numbers except for this ocean proximity, which is stored as an object type, um, but that really just means string. So, and we can look at what the values that this ocean proximity variable takes by using our dot loc method to do the subset to select out the column from the data frame and then calling the value counts method. So if we run this, we'll see that um, there are a little over 9,000 uh, census districts that are within an hour of the ocean, um, 6,500 that are classed as inland, um, 2,600 that are near the ocean, 2,200 that are near the, the bay, uh, which is probably the San Francisco Bay, uh, given that this is a California data set. And then there are five census block districts that are actually islands. Okay. So this is just kind of like basic data analysis, familiarizing yourself with the data and things like that. Um, always a good idea to compute some descriptive statistics. So we can use the dot describe method on the data frame to compute, um, you know, kind of means, maxes, and mins, standard deviations, court, uh, quantiles, things like this for all of the numerical uh, variables. Um, so it can kind of give you ideas of ranges, help you identify outliers maybe. Um, so if we look through here, um, we have, so housing median age. So we have um, one census block group where the housing, housing median age is one year. So that's very, very new. That means that on average, all the houses in that uh, 
that census block were basically brand new. And then on the other end, we have a census block where the average age is over 50 years. So that's, um, um, you know, that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, the other thing to look at would be maybe if we look at our, the descriptive statistics for the thing that we're trying to predict. So the median house value. So we can see that the max value is uh, just a little bit over 500,000. And when you see really round numbers like that, you might wonder, well, maybe, maybe there's something else going on, uh, going on here. Like in particular, maybe there's an upper bound on the median house value, value values in the data set, for example. We'll see some of that. That will come out, that is true in this data set, and it will come out very clearly when we actually start plotting our data, which is the next thing that I want to show you. So it's really important to plot your data. You can learn a lot by looking at your data in different ways and looking for patterns and things that um, may not be as obvious from, um, from just looking at kind of simple descriptive statistics. So here, we're going to plot a histogram with 50 bins of our target variable. So that's the median house value. And when we look at this histogram, I'm going to make this a little smaller. When we look at this histogram, um, so the x-axis here is median house value. And then the uh, y-axis is the number of, uh, number of census block groups that fall into that particular bin. And the first thing that you'll see is that there are a very large number of census block groups who have been lumped into the 500,000 median house value. And that is a strong indication that this data set is actually uh, censored in the sense that it does not report the actual median house value for census block groups whose median house value is greater than 500,000. So it basically lumps all of those right into the same bin. And so this is a problem. It's a problem because um, we don't want to do that with our model. With our model, we want to actually predict the actual median house value in a census block group. We don't want to you know, bend these houses like this. So we're going to have to make a modeling choice later about what to do with these values. Do we? want to drop them from the analysis, or do we want to try to go back and collect more data to maybe build a model to estimate this upper tail of, of houses separately and then use the predictions for that model as inputs to this model? Um, we'll have to make some modeling choice. So that's something, whenever you see a big spike in your histogram like this, that's something that you need to investigate more. Okay. Another simpler way to plot, so here's a, a way to plot this histogram using matplotlib. Another way is to just plot it using the built-in um, plotting functionality of your pandas uh, library. And so here we can just run this cell and this is actually gonna print histograms for the entire data frame all in one, uh, one graphic. So we can look here and see that we have, um, our longitude and latitude are, um, of our census block groups are, are bimodal. So we've got two peaks. Um, and you know, if you're familiar with ca California geography, you'll know that there is like a big cluster of people that live in Southern California, like Los Angeles, San Diego, around there. And then another, um, another peak that lives up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so we'll, these, are, these two peaks are probably corresponding to roughly the latitude longitude coordinates of the LA, greater LA area, and then the greater San Francisco Bay area. Um, so housing median age. So again, we've got this kind of peaks of um, and housing median age, but then also this big spike here. So it looks like we might have the same issue with housing median age that, um, um, that if, uh, if we have large numbers of, of very old houses, older than 50 years, are just lumped in together. 
So they don't, maybe they don't know whether, how old the houses are, if they're older than 50 years, or then maybe they just thought that it's not worth being specific. So that might also be an issue. So we might have to think about how are we gonna deal with that? Um, and we have, I mean, we've got total rooms and total bedrooms and population and households and median income. And we already talked about median house value, but one of the things to notice about these variables is that none of them look terribly normally distributed. Um, particularly like total bedrooms or total rooms, total bedrooms, population, households, they're right skewed. So they all have a very heavy right tail. So there are either some outliers that we have to think about, um, how are we gonna handle these outliers? Um, or, um, or maybe we can do something like transform, uh, apply some data transformations to um, either these variables directly or um, as part of the feature engineering process, create some different variables, which we would then transform to make them look more normally distributed. Um, many machine learning algorithms um, uh, make strong assumptions about the inputs of the data and the distributions of the inputs. And in order to make these algorithms perform as, um, as good as they possibly can, we often have to do a lot of pre-processing on our data to take data which is not very well normally distributed and find um, explanatory variables or, or construct features or transform these raw data distributions so that they look more, um, more normal or more standardized. Okay. Um, right, okay. So I wanna give, uh, let's just take a few minutes, uh, three minutes and have, um, um, have you guys think a little bit about any other, any other questions you have about this, um, this data set. I'm sorry, just, uh, just one moment. I'm gonna, whilst you guys take a few minutes and think about that, I am going to see what my daughter wants because she's just knocked on my office door. So be right back. Okay, so I'm back from our, uh, our short little, uh, little break. Um, so are there any questions um, about, let me share my screen again. Are there any questions about kind of data distributions and things before we, uh, before we move on? Let me, uh, so I've written some notes down here um, are basically things that I've, I think I've verbally covered all of these, but there are some notes here if you want to um, you know, look at them more deeply and you can, I toggle this by just kind of clicking this little box over here to turn it, open up that, uh, that cell. Okay, um, let me just check the chat really quickly. Um, so what changes does it make if the data are normalized or not? Right, um, so many machine learning algorithms only work well if the data is normalized. Some algorithms are quite robust to the input distributions of your of the variables that you're using to predict, um, but many are not. And so it depends a lot on, on which algorithms that you're going to use. Um, and um, and the, what I typically do is I end up using trying many different algorithms and I will try normalizing the data and not normalizing the data and see what difference it makes. Um, and we'll, we'll see kind of ways that you can do that when we start talking um, about feature engineering, which is in the second part of this afternoon's uh, workshop. Okay, so mo moving on. So the, creating a test set. So we've just quickly looked at the data. Um, and to get a sense of what the distributions look like and things like that. But now what we need to do is split our data set into training data and testing data. And we wanna make sure that we hold out our testing data for when we go to validate our model or models against one another. 
So we don't want to um, we don't want to build a model that memorizes the training data set. That's called overfitting. So in order to guard against overfitting, we need to make sure that we have some data that was not seen by the model when the model was trained to assess how well that model is actually performing. And so that's why we're going to create a test set. And we do that very early on. It's very important to, to split your training data and your testing data, save your testing data um, somewhere on disk, and then don't look at it again until you're ready to assess the performance of your different models. Now, I've presented some code here. Um, if, you, um, if you're working on a data set where that data set might change in the future, like you might get new data, more data, like if this was, um, you know, if we only had a, a subset of our California data and eventually we're gonna be getting more data, um, like if we were doing house price prediction in California now, we might be using something like a service like Zillow or or something to get to get data on house uh, house prices and of course the houses come on the market every day go off the market every day so our data set might be changing a lot we might getting new data all the time and we need to make sure that we can make a consistent training data set um, even when we're getting new data all the time and so there's a, a more um, elaborate discussion of how and why you can do that you might need to do that I presented the code here. Um, we're in an easier situation in that we don't have this problem. We have all the data that we're ever going to have. And so we don't have to deal with some of the uh, intri intricate um, issues that you have to deal with when you might be refreshing your data over and over. So there's more on the book on, uh, on this. So I'm just going to pass on it for now. So for us, we have all the data that we're ever going to have for this problem. And so we're going to use the model selection function from scikit-learn um, or the model selection module from scikit-learn to do our train test split. And so this code here um, imports uh, NumPy and, and the model selection module from scikit-learn. And then we are going to create a random number generator with a particular seed this is very important. Setting the seed is very important when you're doing your train test split because you want to make sure that you are repeating the same train test split all the time. If you don't set a seed, you'll get a different training and testing split every time you, you would run this code. And then if you, if you did that over and over again, then effectively your model would see all the testing data, which is not what we want. Okay. So here, um, we're going to use the model selection train test split function. And we are going to split our housing data frame into 20% test data and 80% training data. And then we pass in our, uh, our random state variable, which is basically is just the random number generator. And so this is a repeatable random split into training data and testing data. Okay. So if we run this code, ah, lost my kernel again. Um, so if we run this code, oops, I've lost my, now I have to go back up here and I'm gonna reload my data frame. And there we go. If we run this code, so we've split our data into training data and testing data. Okay, great. So, so now we're going to look at the, the distribution of median income from our, our, this is from the whole data set. Okay. So we might think that median income um, now I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a slightly different way to split the data than just doing a pure train a random split, which is what we did this first split. So median income is probably going to be a very important variable in predicting house prices because obviously people have to purchase houses. They typically have to borrow money in order to purchase a house. And the amount of money that they can borrow is probably going to depend on their income. And 
and therefore the amount of house they can afford, the house price that they can afford is also gonna depend on their income. So we think income is probably gonna be very important. If we have a variable, which we think is gonna be very important, we might wanna make sure that the distribution of this variable in the training data and the testing data is the same. Um, we're not quite sure someone has scrolled on my screen. I didn't know that was possible. Hmm. Um, <laughs> that's okay. I didn't even know it was possible. Um, but if you could try to erase it, that'd be great. Um, um, right. Um, so if we look at the distribution of median income and the testing data, we can see that it's not quite the same. It's maybe a little bit hard to see. I'll try to make this um, smaller, but you can see that um, the distribution isn't the same. I mean, you can look at the, the y-axis scales. I mean, the shape is kind of similar, but you can tell that the distributions are not the same. So instead, what we want to do is um, do something called um, stratified random sampling to make sure that the distribution of median income in the test data set is an accurate reflection of the distribution of median income in the whole data set that we have. So that way um, we can be confident that when we're assessing the model performance on the test data, that the test data accurately reflects um, um, accurately reflects the um, um, the training data. And uh, let me see, maybe I can erase it. And say, uh, clear. Uh, there we go. Okay, I did it. And uh, okay, now we're back. So um, so uh, so there's a question. You know, if we make sure that the train and test data have the same distribution of a certain variable, will that give our model an unfair advantage? So we're we're not. Um, what we're doing is we're saying that. Um, when we look at the whole distribution of median income in the whole population, what we're saying is like um, median income is a very important variable for predicting house prices. So when we go to assess our model, we want to make sure that the, the data on which we assess our model performance is an accurate reflection of the distribution of these important variables. Because otherwise, we might think that our model is performing badly because we have a weird distribution of median income in our test data just by chance. Because if we just do this completely random uh, train test split, we could randomly end up with a really weird looking median income distribution in the test data. And then we would train the model on a very typical looking distribution of median income. And because this variable is so important, when it goes to predict on the test data, which has a weird distribution of median income, it might, uh, it might give us the impression that our model is performing poorly. And so to avoid this, we're just going to make sure that the distribution in our test data is an accurate reflection of the overall distribution for this variable. Sometimes you might do this for multiple variables. Exactly, you want your test data to reflect reality, particularly in the dimensions of reality that are, um, that you have maybe either other reasons to think are, um, are very important, like median income. So we can do this by um, basically binning our median, our median income um, distribution is a continuous distribution, but we can actually bin it into bins and kind of then create a way to make sure that when we do the sampling, we get the same number of samples uh, in the test data 
that were observed in the whole data set. And that's called stratified sampling. And there's a link here to a Wikipedia page, I think, on stratified sampling. So you can read, read more about how to do that. The pandas trick is this really interesting function called cut. I'm not going to dive too deeply into it um, because I just wanted to kind of mention it in passing that this is stratified sampling is an important technique that you should be aware of. Um, and, and it's really easy to do in scikit-learn and pandas. So you, there's a stratify um, parameter in the train test split, and then you can pass in a, um, um, a variable that you want to do the stratified sampling based on. And that's what I created here. And I, and I made sure that it's a reproducible again. So we set our seed and then we do our train test split. And now if you look at median income distribution in the testing data and compare it to the median income distribution in the whole data set, the whole data set has a much larger number of samples. So the y-axis is different, but you can see now the shapes of the distributions are much more uh, similar. So uh, yes, so is this like converting continuous data to categorical data? Yes, so this process here of using this cut function to chop up a continuous uh, variable into a uh, categorical or discretized variable is one way to convert continuous data to categorical or to um, discrete data. Okay. So now that we've done this, we can go ahead and save the data. So here, I'm just going to write out my training data and my testing data to disk. And then that way we can, once we've done the split, we can then work off of these split data sets already. We don't have to go back and run this code over and over. So if we run that, it will write to disk. And if we look inside our, um, so we were in our notebooks directory. So if we go up, and into the data directory and into the housing directory. So here's the training and testing, which were created a few seconds ago. Okay. Um, so there's a question, a more advanced question about k fold cross validation, which we'll talk about um, uh, later this afternoon, but that is uh, addressing a different issue. So no, so capable cross validation is addresses a different issue. It's not going to take care of this uh, stratification uh, sampling up front. Right. Okay. So now we have our training testing split. So now we want to explore and visualize the data some more. So um, we can make some scatter plots. So here's an example of scatter plots, and I think when my kernel died. I forgot to execute a cell up here. Uh, ah, this cell, which imported matplotlib. So I got an import error uh, here. So now if we run this, so here's a scatter plot. So I'm doing a scatter plot of longitude and latitude and if you kind of squint and turn your head sideways, maybe this might look like California. So we've plotted longitude on the horizontal axis, latitude on the vertical axis, and then you can kind of, you know, the Pacific Ocean is over here, so there's no census districts there. Then, you know, the state of Nevada is over here someplace. You know, Mexico is down here. So this is going to be the Southern California cluster of Los Angeles and San Diego. This is the Bay Area right here, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this little cluster over here is right on the California Nevada border um, around a lake called Lake Tahoe. Very expensive houses in Lake Tahoe, um, even in 1990. Um, so being near water um, might be a big predictor of why houses are so expensive in some parts of California. Um, so anyway, so you can kind of make out California, but we can do better than this on the plot. So in particular, we can use um, this alpha parameter in the plot 
to make the scatter, the, the dots in the scatter plot um, differently uh, or transparent. And so when we do this, we get this nice effect, which actually helps make the, the dense urban clusters stand out a lot more. So here it's more easy, you can more easily pick out Los Angeles and San Diego, and then the San Francisco Bay Area, and then this urban cluster here might be maybe Sacramento. Um, and then here's our, our Lake Tahoe cluster here. Um, and then there is urban areas up here. This is near the right on the Pacific coast. And so the, these urban areas stick out uh, a little bit more. Okay, so let's make yeah another plot where we are going to um, make the size of our scatter plots proportional to a particular variable. And we're going to color the dots in the scatter plot differently depending on a value of some other variable. So here we're going to make the sizes of our scatter points proportional to the population. So a bigger population is going to make a bigger circle. And here I've divided the overall population by 100 just so that the circles don't become huge uh, for, some, for some census districts. And then we're going to color depending on our target variable. So um, we're going to get a color scale, which is going to make really cheap houses on one end of the scale and really expensive houses on the other end of the scale. And so now if we run this code, we get something that looks a lot closer to what you what we saw in the graphic from chapter two. I just didn't overlay or didn't overlay the scattered plot on a map. Um, but you could do that as well if you really wanted to see the actual state boundaries. But here you can see that our expensive houses are going to be colored in yellow and our really cheap houses are going to be colored in a darker purple. And so here you can see that we've got San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles, San Diego, there's lots of yellow. And then as you get more into the mountainous rural areas of California, you start seeing more purple, um, purplish lower housing prices. So already we can start getting a sense of, of things that are going to be predictive of housing prices. So our expensive houses are close to the water. Um, and we've got these tight urban clusters, like a Northern California cluster and a Southern California cluster on the coast where houses are expensive. Um, there are some places that are kind of greenish that are more interior that also have higher housing prices. Um, but it looks like a lot of the lower housing prices tend to be in this more kind of uh, Central Valley region of California or the rural parts of California. Um, and when you are making these plots, um, you are, you're passing in an, a variable here. And this variable is basically uh, explaining, you know, how exactly how to both color and exactly how to size the, uh, the point in the scatter plot. So you have to pass it a variable because we're, si we're making different sizes and different colors for every point on the scatter plot uh, in reality. Um, so we have to pass in a whole variable for that. Okay, so there's some plotting, lots more that you could do with plotting, but I just wanted to show you some examples. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is start looking for numerical patterns in the data, statistical correlations and things like that. So there's a, a core a correlation method, which you can use on your training data, the whole data frame. And if you run this, then you get a matrix of correlation coefficients between every pair of variables in the data set. So you'll see that um, first, this is a symmetric kind of matrix, a symmetric matrix. The diagonal values are all one, because if you take, if you compute the correlation uh, coefficient of a variable with itself, it's always one by construction. Um, and then the correlation of a pair of, of you know, a variable 
like longitude and latitude is going to be the same as the correlation between latitude and longitude. So it's a symmetric uh, correlation is a symmetric um, uh, function. And so these values form a symmetric matrix. Um, positive values mean that the, vari the values of the two variables tend to go up together and down together. Negative values means that um, if, if one variable goes up, the other tends to go down. And correlation coefficients uh, will be between zero or between minus one and one. So one is perfect positive correlation, negative one would be a perfect negative correlation. And so you can look through here and start looking for, val for variables that um, are, have strong correlations uh, with one another. So in particular, we might care about um, correlations between individual variables in our target variable, the thing that we're trying to predict, which is actually this last column here. So if we just wanted to compute uh, correlations between our data in our um, data set, our features, and our target, then we could just select out that median house value column. And then here are the individual um, correlations between the variables in our data set and our target median house value. So median income has the highest positive correlation of all the variables um, with our target. So that means it is a very important variable as you, as you would think um, when trying to predict house prices. Um, and then we have, um, interestingly, there is a mild negative correlation between population and house price, which um, seems a bit odd to me because Certainly, you think of house prices as being um, more expensive in cities or in areas where there's more population um, than uh, areas where there is less population. So maybe we could do some feature engineering to try to improve, find different features that have better correlations with our median house value. We'll talk about that uh, later this afternoon. Okay. So let's see, I think I'm getting, yeah, I'm very close to the end and then we'll take a break. Um, so the thing I wanna talk about with correlation coefficients or the, the, the kind of the warning I wanna give you is that um, correlation coefficients measure only linear relationships between two variables. So um, this you know, 0 0.687 correlation coefficient between um, median income and median house value is a measure of the strength of a, of a linear relationship between median income and median house value. It can't capture, it's not a measure of the strength of any more complicated nonlinear relationships that might exist in your data between uh, median income and median house value. And this is a nice picture that I think kind of illustrates that um, from um, from the chapter two of the book. And particular, if you look at the bottom row, so these relationships between, you know, an X variable on the horizontal axis and a Y variable, if you were to compute the co uh, correlation coefficient between those two variables, it would be zero for every single one of these data sets on the bottom row. But you can see from that there is an obvious pattern or relationship between the two variables but it's just not a linear relationship. And therefore, a, it's entirely missed when you just compute a simple correlation coefficient. So this is a kind of a warning, um, a warning to uh, be aware that yes, correlations are useful, but if your data has more complicated nonlinear relationships between your variables that you're using to, uh, to make your predictions, and the thing that you're trying to predict, your target, then correlations on their own are gonna be insufficient guide to um, modeling that data. So there's a question, is there any relation between the correlation uh, coefficient matrix and the confusion matrix? So the confusion matrix, is, the short answer is, um, is not really. Um, the confusion matrix is at least, um, not in a way that I am, I am aware of. Um, but the 
confusion matrix, uh, for those of you who might not, um, um, might not be aware, is a, uh, a matrix of um, true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. It's a way of, class, uh, of assessing the performance of a, um, a classification model that you fit on, on the data. So um, it's relevant in classification settings. And here we're doing a regression, uh, a regression setting. Uh, so another good question. Uh, and in fact, this is like the million dollar question of how can we capture nonlinear correlations? Well, uh, the answer is, of course, it depends. And real world data is rife with nonlinear relationships between variables and the thing that you're trying to predict. And choosing part of being a good data scientist or machine learning engineer is learning what kinds of algorithms can be used to help consistently um, find those nonlinear relations between uh, in your data, but without just memorizing the data set. So we're going to talk about, we're going to use some very flexible models. And then and this afternoon, we'll, we'll fit some very flexible models that will be able to capture every possible nonlinear relationship between our data and housing prices. And then we're going to see how, um, um, which of those overfit. And we'll talk about how to kind of regularize those models a little bit so that they capture some measure of nonlinear uh, relationships in the data without just memorizing the data set. So that will be after the break. OK, so just a little bit more plots. Um, so there's a scatter matrix. So if you wanted to, you could compute. Um, so pandas has a plotting, uh, has a plotting uh, module. You can make scatter plots of all your data. Um, and then histograms along the, the diagonal. So this is kind of a handy plot if you want to take a look at um, some things. So here's our uh, median income and uh, median house value is this column here. So here's our kind of positive, co positive linear correlation is like this positive slope line that you might imagine exists between this scatter of points. And then here you can clearly see the um, the impact of the median house value having this upward bound of 500,000. So it shows up as a plot, as a line of points right here. Um, looks like there might be some other lines kind of hiding here in the data as well. Um, and then here's the median house, house value, median house age. You've got these points here that form almost a line across the top and across the bottom. So those are kind of data artifacts that we're going to have to manage um, when we before we start fitting our models. Okay, um, what is this? So this is just selecting out um, a particular plot. So here we're, we're doing a scatter plot of median income versus median house value and make kind of blowing it up. So this is just blowing up this plot here, making it a little bigger. Um, so it's more, maybe more obvious kind of what's going on. And here you can clearly see this, this line, uh, this artifact in the data that we're going to have to decide what to do with. Okay. Last thing before we take a break. Um, maybe the raw data features that we have, things like total bedrooms, total rooms, population, maybe these are not the right um, the, or the best variables for us to use. So thinking about a different attribute or different um, variable combinations that might be themselves better predictors of, in this case, housing prices, this is a process called feature engineering. So again, there's a link to uh, the Wikipedia page on feature engineering. And then I've got a link to um, a really cool project called Feature Tools, um, which is also installed in, your, uh, in the software environment. Um, Feature Tools is a library that helps you generate various uh, combinations of attributes or features to create new features that might be even better at predicting um, whatever it is you're trying to predict. Um, very useful uh, for time series data because writing the code to 
try different combinations of lagged values and time series prediction context is, is time consuming and error prone. So they have a very uh, nice set of tools to, to do that. They even have some built in um, tools that will actually use deep neural networks to find an embedding of, if you have a lot of categorical variables, um, you know, some, some data sets or some problems can have you know, millions of different categorical features that have to somehow be usefully leveraged in a prediction problem, you can do something called a, um, an embedding of those categorical features into, um, into a model, basically. So you have like a little sub model that does feature engineering. Um, they have tools for doing that as well. And that's kind of deep feature synthesis. You can look more into that if you're, if you're interested. Um, right, so here are some examples of some kind of just basic feature engineering that I, um, uh, that I thought we might, might be sensible to try. So the total number of rooms in all houses in a particular census block doesn't seem a useful prediction of median house prices, a useful predictor of median house prices. So what we want instead is some estimate of like the average number of rooms per house. And so that's what we get if we take basically the total rooms variable and then divide it by the total household. So we get rooms per household. We could do the same thing with like bedrooms per room. And also instead of population, we might want to use population, uh, uh, some measure of like population density. It's like how many, you know, uh, how many people are there uh, per household in an area? Um, so here's just some examples of how you could do that. So this is like really simple feature engineering. And then we can add, uh, we can take the training data and add these new attributes and then look at the correlation between all of these new attributes and our target variable. And we can see that um, some of these variables like rooms per household um, ha now have a higher uh, correlation than total rooms on their own, for example. Um, and Oh, these are just some examples. And bed bedrooms per room now um, is a very is the most strongly negatively correlated uh, predictor. So basically, houses that have um, high numbers of bedrooms per room are going to have lower housing prices. And um, Maybe that makes that maybe that makes some some sense. So if you have like you know a house that only has uh, you know six rooms and four of them or five of them are bedrooms, then that seems like a weirdly imbalanced house, right? In some set, a, a variable that I think would be very predictive is if you had data on the number of bathrooms in a house, and so then you could do like the number of bathrooms per bedroom or the number of uh, or just the number of overall bathrooms per house um, might also be a, a predictor of housing prices or a useful predictor. But unfortunately, we don't have any data on, on bathrooms here. Okay. Um, so that's all I wanted to cover in this part one. So in part two, we're actually going to start fitting machine learning models. And I'm sure like part two is probably like, oh, wow, you know, this is what I, Thought we we're going to spend all of our time on just fitting machine learning models with scikit-learn, and the answer is, you know, unfortunately, that's not mostly what data science and machine learning engineers do. They spend a lot of a lot of time on this part one prep data analysis, making um, making plots, looking for correlations, things like that, and then they will fit the model, fit models, and. Um, so we're going to take a break. So let's take a nice break. So we'll come back at uh, 20 after 3. So that's almost a 30-minute break. Everybody can have um, a chance to stretch your legs, uh, relax a little bit. Um, and I'll see you again at 20 after 3. OK. Hope everyone had a nice break. We're back. I'm now recording again. Um, so we have about an hour and a half.
um, to cover the, the last half of the training today. Hopefully we'll be able to get through um, most of it. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And I need to go back and start my binder again. It's been a bit more unstable than usual uh, today. Um, so I'm going to go back and uh, just launch the uh, uh, public. Well, I'll try actually, I'll launch the CALS one uh, just because I haven't <clears throat> worked on the CALS binder up in a while. Get feedback to my colleagues. And okay, let's wait for it to launch. And so we're going to be picking up with part two. So here, if I look into the notebooks directory, here's part two. So this is what we'll be doing this, uh, this afternoon. Okay. Right. So we're going to pick up where we left off. And there are, um, with like the second half of chapter two of the hands-on uh, machine learning with scikit learn and Keras and TensorFlow, um, over the break, I shared, I forgot that I shared the link um, to the textbook, but I forgot to also share the link to the GitHub repo for the textbook, which is also online. Um, so I will put that in the chat um, and it will also be in the video description on YouTube, but I will put it here in the chat again. Um, so this has all the notebooks for all 17 or, or sorry, all 19 chapters of that textbook um, so that you can work through uh, and then as well. Okay. Um, so we're going to cover uh, preparing data for machine learning algorithms. So we're going to go through all of the, the pre-processing and things like that, that um, I kind of alluded to in when we were going through the exploratory data analysis. We're going to see how to do that with scikit-learn. We're going to fit some models and we're going to train some models. And then we're going to talk about fine tuning. So it's also called hyperparameter optimization. And then we'll probably end, end there. So we're going to import some libraries, matplotlib, uh, numpy, and pandas. And we're going to read in our training data again. So now we're going to use the training data that we created in the previous notebook. So, um, we're reading it from disk. So we're reading off that training data that we split last uh, earlier this afternoon. So it's the same training data. Just look at the first few rows and, and things. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some uh, feature engineering. Um, and although we're not gonna use feature tools, again, I've got some links here to the feature tools library, which is really cool um, and a, um, a discussion of the importance of feature engineering. So one of the, so fe feature engineering is where a lot of the, the human value in machine learning enters into the picture. So with classical machine learning, you typically have to do, you have to know a lot about the problem domain typically, whether that is um, you know, research or academic expertise, or whether like if you were doing, um, or it could be industrial expertise, um, you have a lot of like of human capital expertise that is required to engineer features that are useful for a prediction problem. And this is a lot of this is dependent on the domain that you're working in. So one example of this is in uh, astronomy. So, um, there's an enormous amount of data that's collected from telescopes all around the world. Astronomers are often interested in classifying uh, supernovae of different types or other things that they see from the telescope data. And there was a paper published a few years ago um, on a technique called auto scan, which was developed by uh, a team at NERSC, which is a, a national lab in the United States that had, I think, literally centuries of experience in astronomy, astrophysics, computer science, um, and put all of that expertise together to hand engineer some features to then use some classical machine learning techniques um, like random forest, which we'll see later this afternoon, 
and they were able to automate a problem that was um, had been a very uh, human labor intensive problem, this classification of supernovae, automate it and get a solution that was very, very accurate. Now, um, a few years later, a, uh, a team of amateur uh, machine learning engineers who are interested in learning deep learning applied a deep learning method, which they called space to vec um, And I've got the links here. And that space to vec was able to outperform this machine learning pipeline that was developed by these uh, scientists at NERSC in large part because the deep learning uh, model was flexible enough to hand engineer or to um, automatically engineer the features that were most predictive from the images that were generated by the, the telescopes. So this is an example of you know, one of the reasons that deep learning has become such a significant part of many um, domains and is popular is because it can it can sometimes replace the very labor intensive feature engineering process. You know, when, when you're doing deep learning, you typically don't do much feature engineering. You just kind of throw a deep learning model at the data and let it, you know, train and hopefully it learns something. Um, and sometimes if you have enough data, that approach works very well. Sometimes it doesn't, and you really do need very well thought out handcrafted features by human experts in order to make progress in your prediction and problem. So um, anyway, if you're interested in more, there's some links there to, um, to kind of dig a bit deeper into that supernova classification problem and, um, and the different, two different approaches to solving it. This is a really cool, uh, cool little problem. So here, what I've done is I've encapsulated all of the feature engineering that we are going to do, which is basically just these simple hand engineered features that we talked about earlier this afternoon, but I've put it into a function. And this function takes a data frame and then returns a new data frame, which contains these new variables. So once we've loaded this function, we can engineer the features for this training data frame. And then we get a new training data frame, which has these extra features. So that's what, uh, that's an example of, normally this feature engineering step would be quite involved. There might be quite a lot going on in this engineering feature step, but I like to encapsulate whatever engineering I'm doing into a function and then apply that function to my data frame and get a new data frame. Okay. Now, data cleaning. So if we look at the descriptive statistics of our, um, of our, um, uh, our new training data frame with these extra features like rooms per household, bedroom per room, um, So, um, so there's a question in the chat of, well, do we need to do feature engineering on the, what about feature engineering on the testing data? And the answer is we do feature engineering on both the training data and the testing data. So think of it as a pipeline. So when we're gonna train the model, we start with our, our raw training data and it goes into a, a process. The one step in that process is feature engineering, Another step might be data pre-processing. Another step might be uh, um, model training and then model predictions and then you know, assessing the model or something like this. When we go to use the pipeline to assess on the training data or the test data set, we will need to do any feature engineering and any pre-processing steps have to be applied in the same way that they were applied to the training data, they have to be applied again to the test data. Um, because the model, the trained model that we'll use to do make predictions on the test data expects the input data to be have engineered features and to be pre processed. And we'll, we'll see that um, as we go along. So that's a good question. So um, we had some issues with median house value and several um, other variables, median house age, median income, 
um, were truncated. So here we have these variables and they're all truncated. So they have this big spike here. So any house that was greater than 50 years in age was kind of lumped into this bin. Any house whose value was greater than 500,000 was all, they were all lumped together. And that's this big bin here. And median income also seems like it's truncated. So like uh, census block groups with really high median income all seem to be lumped into um, the bin about 15, which would be 150,000 US dollars. So um, the easiest thing that we can do um, from a, a modeling perspective is actually just to drop the data. So if we, if we want our model to be able to predict values that are outside of like, um, if we want our model to be able to deal with data whose housing median age might be greater than 50, or whose median income might be larger than 15 uh, or 150,000 US dollars, or we want our model to be able to predict median house values that are greater than 500,000, then we need to effectively just drop, unfortunately just drop these data observations or these data from the sample. Um, you know, if we could go back and collect data to actually replace these with their true values, then that would be better but often that's not an option. In this case, it's, it's definitely not an option. Um, and so we're just going to drop them. And so I've written some code here, so a couple of Python functions, um, one called drop max values that um, identifies a, a threshold above which values should be dropped and then returns a data frame that keeps only those values or keeps only the values that are less than the threshold. So this code should look familiar. If you, uh, you know, recall the training that we did with Python and pandas, we covered a lot of these, uh, these same functions. So if we do shift enter and we, we load these two functions in, so now we can have another step, which is clean the data set. So we're going to clean the data set and we're going to pass in our training data that has our engineered features. Okay, so now we have cleaned training data. And now if we look at these distributions again, you can see that there's no longer these big peaks. We basically, we dropped all of the, the values or all, all of the data samples that had those big peaks. Okay. Um, and so now we're going to separate our training data into our training features and our training target. And we're going to do this um, because we might want to apply different pre-processing or transformations to the, the features themselves and the, um, apply another set of transformations or pre-processing steps to the target. So all I'm doing here is basically um, dropping the median house value from the clean data and calling that training features. And then I'm actually selecting the target value from the training target and so now we just have these two new variables. So now we're going to work with those. Okay. So now we need to talk about missing data. So there are some questions about missing data. And now we're going to talk about how we want to deal with it. So most machine learning algorithms don't handle missing data. So you, you have to, if you have missing data, you've got to figure out some way to handle it. Um, and there are basically three options. So you can drop the data. So basically drop any rows in your data set where that are missing data for any feature or attribute. Um, you could drop columns in your data. So then you drop the attribute or feature that has missing values, or you explicitly decide how to fill those missing values. And um, you can do any of those approaches in pandas. So here's an example of, of um, dropping the uh, um, dropping training samples that are missing any values for total bedrooms. And so you can see when we drop the, um, when we drop any rows <clears throat> that are, um, let's do this. So I'm gonna add another, if we do training, So here's the whole training data. 
And if you look, so you can see here that there's this total bedrooms uh, that has only 14,689 um, non-null values. So it's missing some data. So <clears throat> we could drop all the rows that are, have missing values for total bedrooms. So this is option one. So now you can see we have 14,689 rows. So it's the same number that we had here. We now dropped all the rows that were missing values in total bedrooms. And now we have the same number of, uh, also my kernel again. Hmm. Let's see. I think I just lost everything that was going on. Okay, so let's try to restart the kernel. Is anyone else having technical issues? Well, I'm just going to do this. All right, I'm going to open another instance on the public binder hub, and I'm just going to get rid of the other one. Not quite sure what is going on there, but Just to start again. Okay. And now I'm just going to quickly go through and, and execute these cells um, to get caught back up to, to where we were. Okay. So we talked about dropping all the rows that had missing values. We talked about, well, we could drop the total bedrooms entirely. So now we just aren't able to use the total bedrooms um, uh, feature. Um, but actually, we would also need to drop, if we were to do that, we'd also have to drop the total bedrooms per room um, because that was also missing. So actually, this, this code is not quite right. So what we should we would have to do is then drop uh, total, or sorry, uh, bedrooms per room there. And okay. Um, so option three is to actually talk about how we should fill in the missing values. And that, that's the one that I think makes the, makes the most sense. Um, and, um, the way that we would do that is by thinking, well, how can we use the data we have on total bedrooms to fill in the gaps? And one way to do it would be to use the median. Um, and uh, so what we can do is we can use pandas to compute the median of the total bedrooms and then fill that value in um, as the median for the missing values in total bedrooms. But actually, we would need to do this again so there is a, a slight bug in this code in that what we should do is total bedrooms median and then uh, bedrooms per room median. And then this would become or what was it? Yeah, bedrooms per room bedrooms per room. So we have to compute two medians because we have two, two columns that have missing variables. And then um, we have to do two replacements. 
Now, what we're going to see in a minute is that scikit learn makes it really easy to uh, really easy to do this without having to write this kind of code that I'm writing now, which um, can be buggy. Okay, so now if we were to do this, we would be computing two different medians whose values we would need to then save because we would need to use the same median values when we filled in missing values when we go to the test data. Yeah. So we'd have to save that. And, um, and then here we're replacing these uh, median values in different columns. So we've got a separate median value for total bedrooms that we're going to use to replace the values that are missing in that column, and then a different one um, in uh, the bedrooms per room column. So there's a question about why am I using underscore? So um, in Python, there's a convention where underscore is kind of like a, a private a kind of like a, a, a protected variable or a private variable. Um, I use it when I'm working in notebooks, there are some variables that I intend to use in different across all the cells in the notebook. And there are some variables that I think of as being only relevant within that cell. And so this is a convention that I use so that like this total bedrooms median, um, once I, execute this code. Um, and so you can see here we have all the same non-null values, 14,837 for all the columns. This variable is now can be used in any cell in the notebook, but any variables that I prepend with an underscore is like a reminder to me that that variable was really only supposed to be used within calculations within the cell. But it's a complete um, convention that um, is sometimes used, but often not. So you can, if you find it useful as a convention, then you know you can adopt it, um, or you don't have to worry about it. It's not a, not a big deal. Okay, but this is a bit cumbersome because it requires writing a lot of code ourselves. Like, wouldn't it be better if there's a way to do this in an automated way? And there is. So Scikit-Learn has a module called Impute. So Impute stands for or means um, filling in missing values. And so in particular, there's a strategy in impute, which is called simple imputer. And with the simple imputer class, you can use different strategies for filling in missing values. And so here we're gonna use the median strategy. So what this means is that um, this uh, simple imputer will be used to fill in missing values for all of the columns. So any column that has missing values, the missing values will be imputed using the median. And there are many other strategies that you could, you could look into. Um, and in fact, the, the strategy that you use to do the, the fill-in of missing values can itself be treated as a hyperparameter and tuned in order to improve the overall performance of the modeling pipeline. So if you think, gosh, you know, I don't really know what strategy I should use for filling in missing values, well, pick one that is sensible, and then you can treat it as something that you can optimize over later when you're doing your um, when you're doing your, your tuning. So you can try different strategies, find a strategy that works the best, and then use that one. Um, right. So the simple imputer is the first kind of scikit-learn transformer that we've encountered. So now I want to talk a little bit about the scikit-learn API. So it's been very, very influential, um, in particular in Dask and NVIDIA Rapids. So uh, Dask, just open the Dask. Um, so Dask is a project for scaling uh, Panda scikit-learn-based workloads across multiple nodes in a cluster. So if you have really large data and you want to use this kind of Panda scikit-learn APIs to uh, do machine learning on your really large data sets. Uh, you can use Dask to do that. And then NVIDIA Rapids is like scikit-learn, but on the GPU. So if you have access to GPUs, then you can install uh, NVIDIA Rapids and use a lot of the same kind of API for pandas and scikit-learn, but just have your code run on a GPU. 
so two projects that you should be uh, you should be aware of. Okay, so the Scikit API or Scikit Learn API is built around three concepts. So there's estimators, transformers, and predictors. So an estimator is any object that can estimate some parameters based on data. That's why it's called an estimator. Simple imputers are estimators because given some data, they will estimate the medians. Now, it's not a very sophisticated estimation, but it is estimating something from data. Um, the estimation itself is performed by the fit method. So all estimators have a fit method. And when you call it, it'll be dot fit, you give it some data and it estimates some parameters. Um, so any parameter that is needed to guide the estimation process is called a hyperparameter. So for example, um, the strategy equals median is a hyperparameter for the simple imputer estimator. And so in addition to estimators, there's transformers. So some estimators are transformers. And what that means is that um, when you fit an estimator to some data or to data, it will estimate some parameters. If a um, if a uh, object is also a transformer, then it can transform input data with the fitted parameters to get output data. So for example, in, in the simple imputers case, simple imputer is a transformer because when given some data, it will be fit to that data with a particular strategy. And then when you use it to transform data, it will take data with missing values and transform it to data without missing values where the missing values have been filled in with the given strategy. Yep. And finally, there's predictors. So some estimators given a, a data set can make a prediction. And there's a method called predict, which is used to uh, take a fitted estimator and make predictions given new data. And we're going to see examples of, but all, all of these methods fit, fit transform and predict um, this afternoon. So let's see an example of this in action. So if we take our simple imputer and then we call the dot fit method with the training features data frame. Uh, da, da, da. Ah, we get an error. And why have we gotten an error? Well, the error message is, is pretty clear. You can't compute the median strategy of non-numeric data, right? So since the median only exists for numeric features, we need to uh, basically split this process, um, this missing values process into two, um, two pipelines, one to deal with the numeric features, one to deal with the non-numeric features. So we're gonna drop ocean proximity and create a new uh, data frame called numeric features. And now when we fit the simple imputer with numeric features, we get, um, it fits, it estimates the median for all of the numeric features in our data set. And we can look and find what those estimated medians are. So these are the estimated medians for all of our numeric features in the data set. And starting in the order in which they existed in our data frame. So this first one would be longitude um, and then latitude, housing, median age, total rooms, total bedrooms, population, households, median income, and then we dropped ocean proximity and so on. Okay. Fortunately, we just, all we have to do is call dot fit <clears throat> and know that scikit-learn is keeping track of these things for us. So if we computed the medians with pandas, we get the same value. Yeah. So you could compare these values and see that we're getting the same numbers, which is good. Okay. Now, we've estimated the medians, but we haven't actually transformed the data. So to do the transformation, we need to apply the transform method. So we take our numeric features data frame, which has missing values, and we call the simple imputer transform method pass in the data frame and get a data frame with no missing values. 
So here we can check whether any of the values in this numeric features data frame are not a number or missing, and we get false. Now, a better way to do this is the fit transform method, which performs fit and then transform in sequence. So I typically don't separately fit and transform. I always do fit transform. And you can see here, we get the same answers again. OK, so that's an example of filling in missing values for numerical data. But now we need to handle the non-numeric features. So we have one non-numeric feature, ocean proximity. And so now I basically selected out the ocean proximity column. And now I have another data frame, non-numeric features. OK. Um, this ocean proximity is um, only takes a limited number of values. Um, and so now we need to do some pre-processing. Or we need to do some, um, we need to find a way to encode these non-numeric data as numeric data. Most machine learning algorithms don't handle strings. They need numbers. So how can we take uh, categorical data, non-numeric string data, and how can we represent it as numbers? So that's what we're going to talk about now. There are several ways to do that. Um, one way to do it, uh, well, and they're all, all the ways are stored in the scikit-learn module called pre-processing. So one way to do it is using something called ordinal encoding. So if we load the ordinal encoder, and then we call fit transform, ordinal encoder is a transformer. And so we pass in our data frame, uh, our, our non-numeric features data frame, which is full of strings, and we transform it by producing an ordinal encoding of our non-numeric features. And now we get numbers. And what this ordinal encoding has done is it basically just said, OK, well, less than, um, um, less than one hour of the ocean can be zero, inland can be one, near ocean can be two, near bay can be three, and island can be four. And then I'll just go in and replace the strings with a number code. And there's a question about what's the difference between ordinal encoding and one-hot encoding. And I will talk about that in just a minute after I've shown you how um, to do one-hot encoding. OK. So if we look at the categories of our ordinal encoder, so you can see so zero maps to um, the index into this is the actual integer code that's used. So zero is ocean, inland is uh, one island, and there's no examples of island here, um, and then near ocean, so here's near ocean. So zero, one, two, three, four, okay. Now, ordinal, um, uh, ordinal encoding assumes that nearby values, it's a way of encoding um, non-numeric data with numbers with the assumption that nearby values are more similar than distant values, right? So this might be okay for, for some cases. Like for example, if the categories, if the string categories have a natural ordering, then ordinal encoding is a good idea. So for example, if the strings were bad, average, good, and excellent, and we mapped this to zero, one, two, and three, then that makes some sense because like bad and average zero, map to zero and one and zero and one are close to one another and bad and average are close to one another. So, or closer to one another than zero and four, which would be comparing bad and excellent. So like ordinal encoding makes sense when your non-numeric data has some kind of natural ordering. And this happens a lot. However, um, in this particular case, it doesn't really make sense, does it? There's no real natural ordering here. So you might say, OK, well, near water. So is there an or a way to order this such that you know, things near the water are ordered? So maybe like islands should be, you know, islands are in the water. And then 
uh, near the bay and near the ocean or near the water than within an hour of the ocean and then inland is on the other end it's a bit of a stretch, right? Like it may be, but uh, when you have non-numeric data that have no natural ordering, then a better strategy than ordinal encoding is one-hot encoding. And one-hot encoding is, um, is what we're going to talk about now. So you can, uh, in the pre-processing processing module, there's a one-hot encoder. And now if we take our one hot encoder, call the fit transform method on our non-numeric features data, we get back a transformed uh, features matrix. And if we look at it, it's listed as a sparse matrix. We can't really like see the data. Well, that's because when you do one hot encoding, um, you take a single column and you replace it with multiple columns of zeros and ones, where if a particular row in the training data set, um, so for example, all of the rows in the training data where ocean proximity was island, there would be a column where there would be one if that row was an island for ocean proximity and zero everywhere else. And similarly for all the other different, uh, different variables. So it creates this sparse array because actually most of the entries are zero. So rather than waste memory storing a huge, potentially huge matrix, most of whose entries were zero, you just store a sparse matrix. Scikit-learn does this for you. But since we want to look at it, we can change it to a NumPy array. And so we can see here, so now it, it is ones and zeros. Yep. And if we want to look at our one hot encoder categories, we can see that, so this, this zeroth column here corresponds to an ocean proximity of less than one hour to the ocean. This uh, first column here corresponds to inland, the second column corresponds to island, the third column to near bay, and the fourth column to near ocean. Okay. Now, here our categorical uh, attribute only had um, one, two, three, four, five, only has five categories. But it's not uncommon for um, some categorical um, attributes or features to have thousands, 10,000s of different, um, uh, uh, different categories, in which case you take your a one hot encoding will take a single column of data and transform it into if there were 10,000 categories into a 10,000 column by however many number of training samples you have matrix, which is a big expansion in the number of features. And you might have many categorical variables here we only have one. But what if you had you know, 10,000 categorical variables, each of which had 1,000 categories? If you did one hot encoding for all of them, you would have an enormous number of features. So in particular, when you have so many features, there are some machine learning algorithms that don't scale very well as the number of features gets larger. So there are advanced strategies where you can take these large um, um, matrices of one hot encodings or non numeric data and um, use uh, deep learning uh, to embed these uh, feature, these, this high dimensional uh, one hot encoding space into a, um, into a lower dimensional subspace. And so basically, instead of having you know, tens of thousands of features, all of which are different combinations of ones and zeros, you uh, reduce the dimension of that feature space down to something like maybe 10. And there are classical machine learning techniques for doing that, but increasingly deep learning is used to, to do that. And this is an approach that's called feature learning or representational learning. And it's covered in actually chapters 13 and 17 of the introduction to uh, or hands-on machine learning. So here we can just do one hot encoding and move on. But in many real world uh, problems that you might encounter in your research or in your job, you might end up with lots and lots and lots of variables like this. And then you need to know what to do. OK, so, so now we've talked about different ways of encoding. And now we want to talk about feature scaling. So um, machine learning algorithms often don't work very well if the input 
attributes have different scales. So let's look at our train features again. Um, so something like population, you know, has a max of uh, 35,000 and a min of three. Uh, median income only ranges from uh, 0 0.49 or 0 0.50 to 13. So the ranges of these different variables are, are quite large. And that um, these different scales for your variables can lead to very distorted um, uh, feature space. And if we think of our, um, um, our machine learning algorithms as optimization algorithms that are trying to find an optimal set of parameters inside this very high dimensional feature space, then what this means is that with variables of different scales, you have a lot of, um, of places where the algorithms can get trapped and not perform very well. So by rescaling the variables, making all the variables have the same scales, we can help our machine learning algorithms perform better. And so it's a very important step. And there are many ways to do it. You can actually treat your strategy of, um, um, of scaling the data as a hyperparameter. And you could try different ways of scaling the data. Like you could try min-max scalar, and then you could try um, um, standard scalar. Uh, standard scalar is um, one I'll show you in a minute. Um, but you could just try different ones and take the one that performs the best when we get to hyperparameter tuning. So a min-max scalar is going to scale all the variables to be between 0 and 1 by default, or some other um, min and max, if you wanted to choose a different min and max. So if we did min max scalar, and now if we do um, fit transform on our data that has no missing values now. So this is like step two in the pipeline. So the first step was filling in the missing values. The second step is doing the rescaling. Then we can look at the min and the max. And so now we get, we've transformed our data that has no missing values into a scaled version of that data. And so these are the mins and the maxes that were used in the, um, the rescaling. And scikit-learn saves these because we're going to use these same mins and maxes when we do the rescaling of the testing data. So that's very important when we um, it's, it, you think of this as part of training the model. So when we go to assess the trained model on the testing data, we have to make sure that we use the same estimated parameters for even the pre-processing steps that we estimated on the training set when we go to the test set. Okay. Um, so what happens? So what happens if you have an attribute that has outliers and you apply min-max scaling? Well, let's look at a plot. Okay. <clears throat> so if you have outliers, and so here I'm making these, these are called um, box plots where they have basically um, the inner quartile range. So the difference between the, um, like the middle 50% of your data, and then you have a median here with a green line. And then these are, I think by default, 1.5 times the, um, uh, times the uh, 25th qu uh, quantile and the 75th uh, quantile, 1.5 times that gives you uh, uh, the upper bound. It's a way of spotting outliers. So basically all these little black circles are potential outliers in our data. And we knew that we had a lot of outliers because when we looked at the distributions, they all had this like heavy right tail. They were very not normally distributed. And so when you have a lot of outliers and you apply the min max scalar, that doesn't do anything, um, that doesn't help you deal with these outliers. The min max, all it does is basically rescale these ax axes so that instead of different scaled axes all the way around, you would have um, zero to one common scale across all of these variables. But you would still see the same box plots here. 
with outliers and everything. A better way to, to when you have outliers that you want or distributions that you want to make them appear to be more normal, then you can do the standard scale. And so here, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do uh, standard scaling. So if we do standard scalar, and then we do the same thing, we do fit transform, and then we can look at the mean and the scale parameters. So these are like the means and the standard deviations. And, um, and then the data will be transformed such that all of the variables are assumed to have mean zero and standard deviation of one, which is what a standard scaling transformation does. Okay, cool. So we covered a lot here. And you might think like, gosh, this is a lot of, a lot to keep in my head. I've got like through pre-processing, we talked about filling in missing values and we've got fit transform methods being called and we've got all these different scaling techniques and oh, like this is just a lot. Fortunately, scikit-learn, it is, so first it is a lot, it is a lot. So if you're feeling a bit lost, like that's totally normal, totally okay. I was the same way when I was just first, you know, getting started in this, like it's, it's expected that you will be a little bit confused. So, um, but scikit-learn has made life easy for you because they have this concept called pipelines and it allows you to create pipelines of these transformations. So here we're going to create two pipelines, one pipeline for dealing with our numeric data and one pipeline for dealing with our categorical data. Okay. So when we execute the cell, we basically created a pipeline and we give each stage in our pipeline a little name. And I just call it an imputer and standard scalar. And, um, and then we give it, however we're going to do whatever it is our, our pipeline stage is. So a pipeline stage has a name or pipeline step has a name and then a step in the pipeline, which is an estimator or a transformer rather. And so we're going to put our, you know, so I'll just put a little note here. So handle missing values. Um, and then rescale the data. Okay, and then for our um, categorical pipeline, we, we just have to do uh, one hot encode. So um, encode our non-numeric data. <clears throat> okay, and here we don't actually have any missing values for this, um, for this variable, but if we did, we'd also have, um, um, another, we could just have another st strategy there. We couldn't use the median. We'd have to use something else like the mode or something that exists for non-numeric data. But if we had missing values, uh, we could do that. Um, so I'll, I'll comment it out, but I'll show you that, what that would look like. So I think, um, let me just double check if this is, this is true. So if we do simple imputer, uh, so strategy mean, so, uh, most frequent. So in here, there's a, a most frequent strategy, which can be used with strings or numeric data. And so what I, what you could do is you could go in here and you could add a pipeline stage where you had, um, um, most frequent. And, and then this would be the one that handles the missing values for the non-numeric uh, non data. So the, the hash, this is just a comment. So basically this is just gonna be ignored. I'm just putting it in here for you to give you more explanation of what the, this is called an inline comment. Um, and I'll just line them up to be neat and tight. So you could do this. Um, it's not necessary. Um, and I might want to give this a different name. So I'll call this uh, uh, categorical uh, imputer. And maybe I'll call this one uh, numeric imputer, something like this. Okay. I'll actually leave this in. I don't think it should make a difference. We don't actually have any missing values. 
but maybe we might have missing values at some point. So it's probably a good idea to, to handle, uh, handle them. Um, and now we can actually combine these pipelines using something called a column transformer. So there's a compose module in scikit-learn that allows you to compose transformers together. And so now we, we're going to create a list of our numeric uh, attributes and a list of our categorical attributes. And then we're going to create this column transformer. And this pre process, and we're going to call this our pre processing pipeline. Okay. Now we can fit transform our original training features. Now remember, these original training features have, we've done feature engineering already, yeah? but these training features have missing data, they're not scaled properly, um, they've got all sorts of problems. But now that we've created our pre-processing pipeline with basically these two cells and one line of code, we can um, prep our data. We can fill in the missing values. We can uh, and fill in the missing values using different strategies for our numeric data versus our categorical data. Then we can do um, uh, for our categorical our numeric data, we can do rescaling. And then for our category data, we do a one-hot encoding. And then if we look at our uh, pre-processed training feature, or now we have this NumPy array. And um, then here, um, I'm basically converting. So, Scikit-learn can take in pandas data frames, but it works with NumPy arrays. So basically, once the data frame goes in, it's going to end up being an array. Um, and uh, so here, basically, this code is just for, for teaching purposes. It converts the um, it converts the array back into a data frame so that I can just show you what it looks like because it's more it's easier to look at the data frames in a notebook than it is to look at arrays. Um, so for example, if I was to put, if we were to just try to look at this, we'd see that this is a NumPy array. So like, it's hard to really look at and visualize what it is. But then if we do a little bit of cleaning, we can put it back into a, um, um, into a data frame. And then we can look at it. So you can see here is um, this value, this value the same, this value, and this value the same, so on and so forth. And if you scroll over, so here's our one hot encoding of our categorical variable. And then these are all of the, the in columns where we've imputed all the missing values and we've standard scaled all of the, all of the um, um, all of the variables. So now all of these are going to be much more normally distributed than the original variables. And they'll all have mean zero and standard deviation one. Okay. Um, I've got some links in here to this feature union class as a way of combining several transformer objects. So it's an even nicer way of making pipelines. Um, it's a bit more of an advanced topic. I don't want to go too far into it. Um, there's a nice little, so I, but the links are here. So like, if you want to go and click the link, you can read the documentation about even more advanced features for building up these pipelines. But when you're working with scikit-learn, you really want to be thinking in terms of pipelines. You've got raw data. It needs to go into a pipeline where we're going to do some filling of missing values, some rescaling, some, maybe some feature engineering. Uh, although we didn't incorporate the feature engineering as part of the pipeline, you could. Um, and think in terms of pipelines. And eventually, out of the other end of the pipeline is going to come some predictions. So we can visualize these things. So here's some code that basically um, I don't know, sets a configuration value in the scikit-learn config file so that when we, um, when we look at the pre-processing pipeline, it gives us this nice um, um, graphic. So we have um, uh, 
um, and you can click it. So we've got our simple imputer and we can see kind of what hyperparameters were set for that. Same with the standard scaler, one hot encoder. Um, and then you can even click on the column transformer and you'll get basically the code that was used to create the column transformer, things like that. So it's a nice way to visualize what could be a very complicated pipeline. Okay. So now we've, we've, we're done with our pre-processing. So now we're actually ready to train a model. Yep. So we've got about 45 minutes left. And I think this is, a, again, um, a fairly accurate uh, reflection of the amount of time that uh, you will spend on data analysis and pre-processing relative to um, actually fitting the model. Okay, so, but now we are ready to fit a model. So let's do it. So let's start with a simple model, simple linear regression. Now I'm not going to dive in. I'm not going to dive into the details of the different algorithms. So um, I'm going to go through and show you how to fit different algorithms of varying levels of complexity. Um, but the textbook has a whole chapter on each of these kinds of algorithms. So if you want the details on the um, on the algorithms themselves, I'll refer you to the relevant chapter in the textbook. So here I'm just going to go through how to fit the models. So uh, scikit-learn has a linear model package, has a whole bunch of stuff in that package. One of the models it has is just linear regression. And once you've created a, a variable called regressor, or call it whatever you want, I like to call it regressor, and then you instantiate the linear regression class, it has a fit method. A regressor is an estimator, so it has a fit method. And we pass in our features and our target, and that's it. So that's fitting a model. So once you have pre-processed the data and once you've selected your model, fitting a model in scikit-learn is usually like two lines of code. Find the model, fit the model, two lines, done. Um, and for a data set of this size, the, the fitting, the training of the model, the estimating of the model parameters takes like, it's instantaneous. Okay, so now we need to evaluate our model and we wanna use root mean squared error. So let's evaluate it. So we have our trained model and we're gonna call the predict method. And here we're going to compute an estimate of the training error. So this is going to be the root mean squared error on the training data set. So we pass in our training data and we get predictions for the model. And then we use our metric, which will be mean squared error. We pass in the true values and our model's predictions. And that gives us a mean squared error. And then we take the square root of that to get the root mean squared error. And then we look at it. Okay, so we have a root mean squared error of $58,150 on, uh, uh, on our training data. Is that good, bad? Mm, doesn't seem great. If you remember back to, if you go back and look at the, uh, where is it? So our descriptive statistics, so the thing that we were trying to predict was house prices and uh, house prices up here somewhere. Um, did I not do a descriptive? Here, here we go. Um, nope, I gotta go up. I'm looking for the average house price. Uh, I didn't compute it. So we go back up to our training data and then we do describe. So our median house value, the average median house price is $180,000 roughly. So an error, a root mean squared error that is, you know, 50 or $60,000 is not very, not very small. So we want to do better than that. 
Uh, sorry, I won't go back up there again. It's too far. Uh, right. Okay. So linear regression is a, is a nice place to start, but it's a very simple model. It assumes that the relationships between the variables are linear, and it it will often underfit a data set that has more complicated relationships. So let's try um, let's try another one. Um, so there's a question in the chat. Um, can't we calculate an accuracy percentage? So accuracy is a, a suitable metric for classification problems, but here we're doing regression. So um, it doesn't make sense to calculate the accuracy as a metric of a regression problem. So let's do another one. Um, so there's a question, can't we do support vector regression? Yes, we could. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I could do that anywhere, but yeah, we can do that. Sure. Um, but let's do decision tree first. So there is a, uh, a package called trees for fitting something called decision tree regression. Um, it's a very powerful model capable of finding very complex nonlinear relationships in the data. So let's fit it. So now and notice that the difference between this code and this code is just this. Instead of linear model dot linear regression, our regressor is now tree dot decision tree regressor. And the rest of the code is the same. So let's fit our decision tree regressor. Done. Um, let's make predictions, compute the metric. Boom, zero. Wow, that's very small. So what does this mean? So we fit this decision tree regressor it has zero error on the training data set. So what does that mean? Is that fantastic? Should we just declare victory and, and, and move on? Well, no, I mean, the, the reality, exactly. So the reality is that this model is massively overfitting. Um, it has memorized the training data. Yep. And when you're getting started, so this is this is um, this is on the this is the root mean squared error on the training data. So we basically just fit a model that just memorizes the training data. That's what we've done. Um, so overfitting is bad, but it is important that you choose a model that is capable of overfitting your data. And then once you found a model that is capable of overfitting your data, you want to go back and um, find ways to regularize the model to address the issues of overfitting. But if your model does not have the ability to overfit your data, then it doesn't have enough capacity to learn the relationships in the data. So in some sense, the first thing that I try to do on all my problems is find a model that can overfit my data. Because if I can find a model that can overfit the data, I know how to regularize it so that the overfitting doesn't, um, doesn't degrade the performance. But if I, if I can't find a model that will, that will overfit the data, then I get worried that the relationships in the data are too complicated that I don't have, um, I can't find a model that will be able to model them. And for example, like linear regression. So like there are some parameters with linear regression that you could try to tune, but there's no way that you will ever be able to model this data set with linear regression um, nearly as well as using some other models that have more nonlinear, uh, the ability, the capacity to learn complex nonlinear relationships. So that's why linear regression is a good benchmark. It's easy to interpret the results of the linear regression co uh, coefficients, um, but it's, op it's only the start. Okay, so we will, so somebody asked about um, support vector regression. So let's do that. So I'm gonna have to create some more cells. So I think the support vector, I think the package is called SVM. And then in SVM, 
I think we need a support vector regressor. So let's see if this works. So we get a warning, but that's OK. And now we wait. And we wait. And we wait. OK, now, what did you notice about the, uh, well, let's look at it. Let's see how well it did first. And we wait, and we wait. Now, what is what is you noticed about the support vector machine? So, don't know what the algorithm is or what it does. Um, I'm not going to cover that. It was slower, quite a bit slower. So we had to actually sit and wait a little bit for the model to be fit and to even to make the predictions. We had to wait a little bit, whereas the decision tree was more or less instantaneous, and linear regression was was also quite fast. One of the, um, the um, support vector uh, machines and support vector regression, if you look at the chapter in the textbook that covers these models in great detail, one of the things that you will see is that they don't scale well with larger data sets. They're very great, they're very good at detecting complex relationships in relatively small to moderate uh, data sets, but they do not scale well. Um, so if you have even a reasonably large data set, the support vector machines will not be computationally feasible. And it doesn't matter really how big your computer is. It's more of a matter of, of um, the lack of parallelization of some parts of the algorithms and um, their inherent uh, scaling behavior of the algorithm itself. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. And it's something that you have to become more experienced at the trade-offs of these different algorithms. Decision trees are very fast. They're highly parallelizable, um, but they have a tendency to overfit. And so you're often going to have to do some other, other techniques to regularize the data sets or the, sorry, the algorithms, the decision tree algorithms to get them to behave nicely. OK, so here we were evaluating the root mean squared error on the training data set. Um, but what we're really concerned about is not how well the models perform on the training data sets, but rather how well the models perform um, on data that they've not seen. So like the testing data, but we're not quite ready to look at the testing data yet. So we're going to use something called cross validation to take the training data set, just the training data set and chop it up into pieces. And we're going to pick the number of pieces that we're going to um, chop the data set into. And in this case, we'll do um, 10. Yeah. So we're going to chop the data set into 10 pieces. And we're going to take nine of the pieces of data, train the model, and then use that model to predict the 10th chunk of the training data. And then we're going to repeat that process a whole bunch of times. And um, and by doing this, we can get an estimate of how well the model generalizes, how well it performs when it's asked to predict the values of data it hasn't seen before. So here's a bit of code that shows you how to do this for the linear regression. So you've got model selection and then cross -val validation scoring. And we're gonna score using the mean squared error. Um, the reason that it's negative mean squared error is just that a score function needs to be, a score needs to be something where larger values are better than smaller values. And if you just use mean squared error, then actually lower values are better than larger values. And so you take the negative of your mean squared error to, to flip it around. So let's do this for linear regression. So we pass in our training data, our training target, the number of uh, chunks that we want to chop our data up into, and the score that we want to use, negative mean squared error, and then our, our regressor, yep. what regressor we're going to use. And then we fit this. And we have to wait a little bit, because now we are doing um, 
um, we're going to get 10 evaluation scores. So we're basically fitting the linear regression model 10 different times and using um, each of the 10 different chunks will get used as the test data set at some point. And now we can get uh, root mean squared errors. So now we've computed the average root mean squared error and the standard deviation of the root mean squared errors. And if we were to look at the scores, we would have 10 scores. So that's why we can compute an average and a standard deviation of the, the scores. So each time we uh, trained a linear regression model on nine of the data chunks and used it to predict the values on the 10th data chunk, computed a, uh, a score, negative mean squared error, and that's the number that we get here. And then um, here we convert those scores. We take the negative and then we take the square root. So we get root mean squared errors and then we compute the, the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, so this is just a way to kind of assess performance. Now let's look at the decision tree. So we're gonna do the same process again, but with the decision tree. So remember, when we fit the decision tree to the training data without any kind of cross validation, it just memorized the data set. But now when we do this cross validation, what we see is that when you do cross validation and you, you you train the model on nine chunks of the data. The decision tree memorizes those nine chunks, but then when you ask it to predict on the 10th chunk, it does a really poor job because it's overfit. And you actually can see that now the decision tree model looks worse. It has a higher uh, average root mean squared error when you do this cross validation score compared with linear regression. So our decision tree model went from looking awesome to actually looking not awesome. Okay, now, so what about a better way? Is there some other way that we could, um, we could model this data? So now we're gonna look at random forest regression. So random forest regression, it takes the decision tree idea and says, well, instead of using just a single decision tree, what I want to do is I want to create a forest of, of randomly generated decision trees and um, train all these different models and then average the predictions of these model of these different models together to come up with an overall prediction. So it's a technique of ensemble learning, which is a great uh, and it's a great approach. Um, it's usually my benchmark for both classification and regression problems is to start with random forests. So here we will fit our random forest model. And it takes a, um, you know, takes some time. Um, even though it takes time, what's interesting about the random forest models is that it's highly parallelizable because it creates this forest of decision trees. So by default, it fits a hundred different decision trees to the data. Um, but each of those decision trees can be fit in parallel to the other decision trees. So actually, actually if you wanted to, it's, so this, this algorithm scales very well to large data sets and also lends itself to being distributed across even multiple nodes um, um, in a cluster. So you can use random forest regression to fit um, models with uh, terabytes uh, of data. Um, using something like Dask, maybe. Um, and it also can be accelerated quite nicely on GPUs. Um, so if you have access to GPUs, you can use random forest progression to accelerate. Um, okay, so let's look at the performance of, so this is now the performance on the whole training data. So 16,608. So it's kind of, when evaluated on the training data, it's in between. So the decision tree model completely overfit the data set, had zero error on the training data. Um, linear regression had a much higher error. Root means the root mean squared error for random forest is a lot better. 
However, we're, it might be overfitting. So let's do this cross-validation approach again to see if it's overfitting. So now we're, we're having to wait a little bit because we only, so these compute instances only have, I think maybe one, uh, one or two cores. Um, so even though this, this model itself can be parallelized very well, um, we don't have a lot of cores to use to do the parallelization. Um, but if you have access to you know, a machine with more cores, then this training process can go very quickly. And actually the cross validation process itself is completely parallelizable because when you're, you can chop up your data into these um, different chunks and then you can train, um, you, know, you can train 10 models in parallel, each using a different chunk as the, the data set that's being held out for cross validation. So there are two questions in chat. Um, oh, very good question um, from Hillel. So if the model is able to overfit on a training data set, does that guarantee that it theoretically should be able to get the same score on the test data if we regularize the model correctly? Um, I would, I think that the answer is no, um, but it is certainly true that the ability, think of each, each model or each algorithm has a learning capacity for a given data set. And you wanna choose a model that has a high enough learning capacity that it can potentially overfit the training data set. Because if it can overfit the training data set, it probably means that you can find a way to regularize the model so that it will generalize well to new data. But if you have a model that is just, if, if, you, if your algorithms are chronically underfitting the training data, then there is going to be some fundamental limit to how well it can perform on new data uh, because it somehow doesn't have enough capacity, learning capacity to, um, to model the relationships that are necessary to predict. And um, this is another reason, by the way, why deep learning models are so popular in particular when they're used in computer vision because computer vision, you have these, these images or even videos, and there's so much data in the video, and the, the relationships are so complex and nonlinear that you need a model with an enormous amount of learning capacity to be able to potentially overfit those, those training data sets. And then once you can get a model that can overfit, you can work on regularizing it to make sure that it will generalize well to, to new data. Okay, so let's look at our, um, uh, so here's the output of our cross validation with the random forest. So it goes up, so it goes up, but not by, um, it goes up by maybe a factor of two and a half or something like that. So this uh, 4,500 is I think roughly two and a half times, uh, um, maybe closer to three times the, uh, the root mean squared error on the whole training data set. So it's gone up, but it's not gone up by like an enormous amount. And it's also better than the uh, decision tree and uh, linear regression. Okay, so at least it looks promising. Um, okay, but again, like the final, the final assessment of different modeling approaches can only be done on the test data, which we haven't done yet. Okay, um, I have some, some examples here um, of uh, other kinds of regression that you can do. Um, so here's support vector regression down here. Um, and 
uh, nearest neighbors, so k, k nearest neighbors regression. Um, I'll run these, see how uh, how long I might let them run and see how long they take. Um, and while they're running, but basically the the idea at this point in the pipe and in your modeling process is you want to find two to three candidate models, two to three models that perform reasonably well, or at least reasonably well relative to whatever your current benchmark is. Because remember earlier this afternoon, we talked about the importance of like, what is the status quo? Like what is the status quo model that this company is hypothetically using to predict uh, housing prices? Yeah, so that's the relevant benchmark. And you compare your linear regression and your decision tree and your random forest and your K nearest neighbors and whatever you're doing to that, whatever the status quo is. And you look for two or three models that are able to improve on the status quo. And then you'll take those two to three candidate models and fine tune them. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So fine tuning is, this is where um, you would be doing your regularization, guarding against overfitting, and, and just generally improving overall model performance. And um, I will, I think I'm just going to stop this. OK, so I stopped this because um, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. And I want to get through the rest of the content here. Um, but if I think, if I remember correctly, if you run these models, you will find that um, uh, basically K nearest neighbors, random forests, and support vector regression do um, um, do reasonably well and are good candidate models to kind of continue the process of fine tuning. However, there's a wide difference of um, compute performance. So the random forest ones are going to be the fastest, the most parallelizable. Um, I think the support vector regressions are the least or the slowest. They don't scale nearly as well. And K nearest neighbors is somewhere in between, if I recall. Um, but you, you can run those codes um, um, yourself. Uh, uh, so yes, so there's a question, can K nearest neighbors work on regression problems? So yeah, so you can use them for either classification or regression. Um, actually, there's a, um, inside this neighbors package, and this is true for many of these algorithms, actually, most of them will work on both classification and regression. Um, if we were to look inside this neighbors package, you'll see that there is a um, K nearest neighbors classifier, K nearest neighbors regressor. Uh, this one um, did know that there was a K nearest neighbors transformer, but apparently there is. So many of these algorithms can be adapted to work on either regression or classification. Um, okay, so uh, fine tuning the models. Okay, so um, fine tuning or hyperparameter optimization um, is a big topic. So I could do a whole workshop on just that. Um, here, I just want to show you kind of the rough idea of how you approach this within Scikit-Learn and then make you aware of um, other libraries for, that are specifically targeted doing large scale um, hyperparameter tuning potentially across many nodes in a cluster. So there are two techniques that are kind of built into uh, Scikit-Learn, grid search and then randomized search. And with grid search, you create this parameter grid and um, you kind of look at the hyperparameters that are available uh, in the model. Um, and so for example, if I look at, um, so random forest regressor. So there are all of these hyperparameters in that model. Well, not all of these are hyperparameters, um, but 90% of them are hyperparameters. Um, and they can be tuned, they can change, take that. Some of them are continuous. Some of them have fixed numbers of choices, lots of combination knobs to tweak, things like that. So what you can do is you can create these little dictionaries of combinations of parameters to try. 
So this one, I'm basically saying, well, let's create a grid where the number of estimators is going to be 10 or 100. And then the maximum number of features is going to be the default setting, which is auto. And then um, the square root of the number of features or the log base two of the number of features. So um, these are the, the parameters that are governing the maximum features that can be in any particular decision tree that makes up the forest. So when you go to do fine tuning, you really have to dig into the details of the algorithm that you're tuning. You have to know how that algorithm works in order for you to be, um, have really any hope of, of making progress on fine tuning the model. So um, here the focus is on showing you like just the mechanics, like an example of how this works. But if you really wanted to tune a random forest regressor for this data set, you'd have to dig in to the random forest regression documentation. You'd have to understand the algorithm, how it works, how these different knobs control overfitting and make it harder for the model to overfit or easier for the model to overfit, um, things like this. So, but you basically, you create this parameter grid, then you're gonna set a random seed and create your random forest model. And then um, pass in the model, pass in your parameter grid. And then what is going to happen is that, so let's see how many, how, how big is our grid? So we have two options. Our first combination of parameters has um, two options for n estimators and three options for max features. So that's two times three or six combinations that will be tried. This second group of parameters is forces a single value for this bootstrap hyperparameter, two values to try for n estimators, and three values to try for max features. So that's one times two times three or six. So in total, there will be six plus six equals 12 different combinations of hyperparameters that we'll, we will try. And for each of those 12 parameter combinations, we are going to do five-fold cross-validation to assess the um, to score the model, just like we were doing this, um, just like we were doing up here with a tenfold CV, we're going to do the same for each of the 12 combinations. So there's quite a lot of computation that's going on here. We have um, five-fold cross-validation and 12 different parameter combinations are going to be tried. So the overall number of models that are going to be fit here is going to be five times 12 or 60. And so you can see how the computation requirements for hyperparameter tuning can explode very quickly. So even with just this little bit, we're doing training 60 random forest regressors with different combinations. But you can also see how powerful scikit-learn is and that this is like 10 lines of code to do that. Okay. So here we have defined the pipeline, the model that we're going to fit. And then we can look in here and see, um, you know, just look at our model. And so now, now that we've created this grid search CV, this is like an estimator. And it has a fit method. And so now all we do is call the fit method. And we wait. And here we're told five folds, 12 candidates, 60 fits. So that was the, that was what I, I mentioned earlier. So there's a question. So how can we run grid search in parallel? The answer is it's done for you. So uh, there's this knob called in jobs, which tunes the number of jobs that you run in parallel. And so here I set the number of jobs to be five. So I'm basically going to run each of my cross-validation jobs in parallel. And, but unfortunately, I don't actually have five cores on this machine. Um, so not all of them will run in parallel. But generally, by default, scikit-learn supports the ability to run grid search in parallel out of the box. Verbose controls how much printing is done. So if you set this to be a bigger number, um, more stuff will get printed out here. And I set it to 10 just to print out some stuff, but not too much stuff. 
but now we wait. And so while we wait, I'll just queue up those cells for compute. And then um, I'll talk about randomized search and then I'll come back to the grid search. So um, the way randomized search works is instead of defining a grid of parameter combinations to, um, to try, you define probability distributions over the parameters that or over the hyperparameters, and then you do sampling from those distributions. So, um, so when you, so one way that you can do that is using SciPy stats, and you can sometimes it takes a little bit of thought to find an appropriate probability distribution for your um, for your parameter. So some parameters are continuous, and so it's a little easier. But some parameters are discrete, and you've got to say, well, how do I define a, a discrete probability distribution that I can sample from? And it's a little complicated, um, but it's a it's more efficient because with randomized uh, search, you define the number of samples of these pro of uh, that you want to take. So here, the computation cost is much lower, and I'm randomly sampling the, the space of hyperparameters, and it's sometimes a more efficient search strategy. OK, so if I go back up here, um, I have, so I did my grid search. When it's finished, I can get the best score from my grid search CV, con convert it to root mean squared error, find out that with this grid search, I was able to get 44,000, uh, 44, almost 45,000 root mean squared error. So that's not really any better than what I got before. Um, so in this case, fine tuning with the simple grid search strategy wasn't able to find a better set of parameters than the default set of parameters. Yeah, and that happens, that happens. Um, you know, just because you're throwing a lot of computation at, um, at a problem doesn't mean that um, it's automatically going to magically find some amazing new solution. It might, but it also might just marginally improve uh, performance or basically not really improve the performance for the default values. Um, a lot of knowledge has gone into, a lot of accumulated knowledge has gone into setting the default values for these models in scikit-learn. So they're, they're generally pretty reasonable. Um, and in my experience, fine tuning often only provides marginal improvement in my metrics. Um, it's not always the case. Usually the way that you get much better improvement is either getting more data, if that's possible, or finding a better algorithm. So if you, if you need to make big gains in your problem, you either need, you typically are going to need to, you know, try different algorithms or get more data or both. Don't expect that fine tuning is going to give you a huge amount of gain relative to what you're, what you're able to get um, by default, I would say. That's just based on my own experience. OK, so there is a question. Um, so there's a question in the chat. So if you're using cross-validation, do we need to make a separate test set at the beginning of our project? Yes, yes, always yes. Um, usually, what, what you're doing with cross-validation is really splitting your, effectively, you're splitting your data into three chunks. You've got training, validation, and testing. and um, in fact, you will, you will many times see data sets split into three chunks and not just two, training, validation, and testing. And that's useful if you don't have tools like cross-validation and scikit-learn to, um, that will help handle all of the additional complexity of cross-validation. A simpler way to do it is always split your data into three chunks, train your model on the training data, tune your hyperparameters on the validation data, and then assess your models on the train on the testing data. 
but you always, always, always need to set aside a test data set. Okay, um, there was a question earlier about how to save the best model. So any model that you save, um, you can use, there's a package called joblib, which is uh, a dependency of scikit-learn. So when you have scikit-learn, it's automatically installed. And you can use this to basically save any Python object to a file. So what we can do here is I've just basically created a timestamp. And now I'm going to use um, this job lib to dump my trained model, grid search CV, to a file with a particular timestamp. So that way I know when this model was done. So I, I run this code. And now if I was to look in the results directory um, and the models directory, so here's this file that I just created, grid search, CV, random forest regression, and a timestamp. Okay. Now, suppose that you did this training and then you wanted to come back like next week and you wanted to uh, do inference. You wanted to use your trained model to make predictions on the test data. Well, you can just reload the trained model. You don't have to do the training again. You've already done the training. You save the trained model, which now has the, the saved parameters in it, and you can just load it. And then once you've loaded it, it's basically the same model that we had up here. It is the same model that we had up here. Yep. So you can see, so here, the, the best parameters of the model that we trained, and then this is the best parameters of the model that we reloaded from the file that we created from the trained model, it's the same thing. Okay, I'm gonna skip the randomized search because we're, we're basically out of time and I wanna show you how to, um, I want to show you, uh, all right. I wanna show you how to do inference, how to predict on the, the training data. Um, Okay, we're gonna to have to skip this section so that I can show you how to do the prediction, but um, analyzing the best models and their errors is a really important step. Unfortunately, we've just run out of time. Um, one of the nice features about the random forest regressor is that it has this thing called feature importances, which you can dig into the chapter on random forest regression to understand how these feature importances are calculated, but it tells you kind of how important the features are in the overall prediction. So you can look at, uh, oh, bother. I need to change this to grid search. Because I didn't do the randomized search. So here's what the feature importances look like. So median income has the highest feature importance. So it's the most important variable in predicting house prices according to our random forest model. Inland, remember that was one of the categories of our ocean proximity is the second most important and so forth. And some of these some of these features don't appear to be terribly important at all. You might want to consider getting rid of them and re, refitting the model, or maybe trying to find a better encoding of the ocean proximity variable besides the one hot encoding. Things like this. Um, right. Okay. So I think this uh, creates. I'm going to change this to grid. And then this plots some uh, prediction errors. So you can see the prediction errors have lots of outliers. Um, so if your predictions have a lot of outliers, then you can kind of go back and look at the associated training samples with where your model predicts very poorly and try to find out like what's going on. Um, and uh, so here is an example of how you could look for census block groups where the model under predicts or over predicts. Um, yeah, there's some other stuff in here. Um, right, okay, but sorry, I had to breeze, I had to go through that very quickly. I want to show you how to do uh, evaluating the system on the test set because this is the most important, this is the last important thing that you have to do. So, we first we need to load the testing data set. So, this is the, the split of the testing data set we created earlier this afternoon, and now we're ready to actually use it. Now, we take our testing data, we engineer the features, 
we take our uh, engineered features and we clean it. Then we, so then we take our cleaned uh, testing data and we break it into our features by dropping the median house value and our target. And then we take our pre-processing pipeline that we fit on the training data and use it to transform the testing features. We don't call fit transform, we call transform. And that is critical. So do not call fit transform. And the reason is that we want to use those medians that we and those uh, most frequent values that we use for filling missing values in the training data. We want to use those same values to fill the missing values in the testing data. If we call fit transform, what will happen is that the pre-processing pre -processing pipeline will recompute the medians and the most frequent values based on the testing data and use those as part of the uh, pre-processing step, which is a form of what's called data leakage. It's an example of where information about the testing data is then leaked in to the modeling pipeline for assessing the ability of the model to predict on the testing data, and that's bad. That's a, a way to get an inaccurate assessment of how well your model actually performs. So don't call fit transform. Transform. You, tra you use your same pre-processing pipeline from, that you fit on the training data to transform the testing features. And then you get your pre-processed testing features. And now we take our grid search, because I didn't fit the randomized search. Um, and we take the, the best estimator and we use it to predict on our pre-processing testing features. And we get our predictions. And then we can compute the, uh, whoop. And we can use them to compute the root mean squared error on the testing data. And what we found if you remember on the training data, we got about $44,000 um, as the root mean squared error on the training data. Here, we're seeing about the same on the testing data. Now, obviously, you know, we want the lower number, the better, because that's the low, we're doing root mean squared error. So the lower number, the better on the testing data. But when you get the same or similar relative magnitudes on the training and the testing data for your model, that's a pretty good indication that your model is, is able to generalize well to new data. So if the model is overfitting, the error on the test set is going to be way high. OK. Um, you could do some statistics if you wanted to. Um, to uh, give you a kind of an interval on um, on how well your model. Oops, I didn't import the stats package. Um, so if you want something better than a point estimate, you can um, um, you can use a bit of statistics to compute a a rough estimate of the confidence interval for this point estimate. Um, it's very rough, but it gives you maybe a little bit better um, estimate of like how well you did. And again, you're comparing, you're comparing your model assessed on the test data against you know, whatever the status quo is. And so if the, and maybe the status quo is, is some human process that has no way to basically compute an estimate of how well it's doing. That happens a lot when you're trying to use machine learning to replace what is a, a human um, centric process. Um, but when you have, you're comparing two machine learning models, if you have a, a current model that is the status quo, you want to you know, assess the performance of the status quo on the test data 
and then you compare the, the performance of your new model on the test data. And ideally you want your new model to have a lower root mean squared error and you want it to be kind of significantly lower. So you would like it to be the case that the, the confidence interval on the root mean squared error excludes whatever the status quo of the current value is. All right, so we've gone a little bit long. So um, thank you uh, for staying with me for a little bit extra time. Um, are there any questions? I know I kind of really sped through that last little bit. So I, uh, I apologize for that. Um, um, but I think we did a pretty good job of getting a lot done in the last four hours. So, okay. Okay, so um, I wanna end with, again, a plug for the uh, hands-on machine learning uh, with scikit-learn, uh, Keras and TensorFlow, fantastic book. Um, again, if you're in KAUST, you can find this in the, um, in the library, a digital copy. Also, um, uh, on GitHub, the, the author has put all the code for the book on GitHub. So all 19 chapters are available on GitHub um, with some other links. Um, he set it up so that uh, you can try it on Binder, the whole book on Binder uh, or on Google Colab um, and some other stuff. So there's a lot that you can, um, you can pick up from here. And, um, you know, even the really advanced stuff. So you can find the, you know, auto encoders and generalized um, and GANs all available here on GitHub. So, um, and you can run them in Colab get, and get access to GPUs. So if you don't have access to a GPU, then you can use Google Colab, get free GPUs and run, uh, you know, run all this code for doing auto encoders and all the other, whatever you might want to do. It's a fantastic book. Um, I'll put links to this. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll be putting links to this in the, uh, the description just below the video. And if there are no other questions, then I'm, I'm done. Okay, so let me just stop sharing for a moment. So there are a couple of questions here. Um, in evaluating any algorithms, is this always done in training? So there, there's evaluating algorithms has a two-step process. So the, the, the final evaluation is always done on the test set. But along the way, it's always good to evaluate your model's performance on the training data. And then, you know, to do some sort of either cross-validation to um, split your training data into training and validation data to, to assess kind of get a better estimate of how well your model might perform. Um, so you always are evaluating your model or your algorithm along the entire kind of pipeline, but the final assessment on which you decide whether this model is better than some other model is always done on the test set. Okay. Um, how about big data on, on HPC? Ooh, that's a, a big topic uh, in and of itself. So many of these algorithms in scikit-learn will scale very easily on a single node. It'll take advantage of as many cores as you have on a single node on an HPC cluster. If you want to scale these algorithms to multiple nodes in an HPC cluster, you should use Dask. Dask is, is well set up to scale scikit-learn models. Um, if you want to use deep learning, um, then TensorFlow um, and Keras will scale to as many nodes and cores and GPUs as, as you have available, um, but you have to learn how to structure your code so that it will do that. Um, but all that, that stuff is covered in the, in the textbook. Um, so, okay, so I focus, so there's a question about, well, what if you wanna compare multiple metrics? So. I focused on a single metric um, for simplicity. Um, it's really, even if you have a, a bunch of metrics that you care about, it would be good to create like a meta metric that 
consolidates like those collection of metrics that you care about down into a single metric if possible. Because what you want at the end of the day, uh, particularly if you're in industry, this is less true if you're doing academic research, but if you're in industry, eventually somebody is going to want to say, should I put this model in production to make predictions or not? And it's really helpful if you can point to a number and basically say this model is better than the status quo based on this metric or this collection of metrics that's represented by this, this number. Um, but there are no hard, exactly how you would do that depends a lot on the context and, and things like that. Like you could compute six different metrics for your regression problem, but whether there are no general rules to say, well, you know, you should, you should care about, you know, root mean squared error, R squared, you know, mean absolute error, and you should mix them together in this capacity. And then that gives you a number that you should care about. It doesn't quite work like that. I will share the YouTube channel and all the links and everything that I mentioned, they're going to be in the description below the, um, below the, the video. So Hilal has a question. So if I understand correctly, the validation set doesn't update any parameters or affect the training of the model. It's only there to give you an idea of how well the model is generalizing. That's exactly right. So you do the cross validation or you manually split your data into train validation and test so that you can um, have some way to assess the ability of your model to generalize to new data before you finally go and do the final assessment using the testing data. Yes, and if you're training neural networks, typically you do not do cross validation with neural networks. And the reason is that the computational cost is too high. So, you know, if it takes order of, you know, days or hours, let's say, even if it takes order of hours to fit, um, you know, let's say it takes an hour to fit your deep neural network. If you wanted to do 60 fits with 12 different, uh, parameter combinations and um, five-fold cross-validation, that would take you 60 hours of compute to do that. Um, and so it's usually cost prohibitive uh, in order to, um, to do cross-validation. So with neural networks, you almost always will split your data manually at the very beginning. Instead of doing a train and test split, you'll do a train, you'll do like a, I do it in two stages. I do like a, a train val and a test. And then I take the train val and I split that into training and validation. So it's like, and you can even use the model selection function in scikit-learn to do that if you want. Um, you just do basically two steps. Okay, cool. So I think that's a good question to end on. Um, and uh, just a quick plug. For next Tuesday, my colleague uh, Glendon Holst will be talking about um, how to do image classification with Keras. So if you want to dip your toe into deep learning with Keras, we're going to do that next week with image classification, um, I believe using the CIFAR 10 data set, which is like a um, like dogs and cats and cars and tractors and boats and stuff like that, class classifying them. So it'll be a classification problem. Um, but that will be taught by my colleague, uh, Glendon, and I'll be just kind of hanging around. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in this whole semester, and um, I look forward to seeing some of you next Tuesday. Bye for now. <laughs>